All right, it looks like everyone's here. Um, good morning, everyone. If you could just confirm you could hear my voice, uh, Dave. Uh, yes, I can. Thank you, Chair. If you could hold up your thumb or something or nod your head, Dave, you can hear me. Yes, I can. Uh, there does seem to be a slight lag, a slight delay, but yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, assuming everyone else can hear me online, welcome to the 96th session of the IPHC interim meeting. We have uh, two days um, to go through the agenda. Um, it's a pretty full agenda for the next two days. This is a new technology that we're trying out, um, given the situation with COVID. So uh, there could be a few um, issues as we go through, but we have an excellent team helping support us technically. So I'm sure that things may um, occasionally go awry, but we'll get it all sorted out. Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you to explain um, a little bit about the uh, public comment and questions. There's three opportunities for the public to either write comments or to also speak to their questions or comments during the course of today. The first uh, time for public comment is after agenda item 6.5, just before lunch. And then the second is after agenda item 7.3. And again, there will be one at the end of the day. So Dave, if you could um, just uh, explain how that process is going to, going to work so people can, if they have comments or questions, they could get them submitted to us um, so we can uh, work through them. I'll turn it over to you now, Dave. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so assuming everybody can hear me, um, Welcome to this, the nice session. As the chair has just indicated, we will have three question and answer sessions uh, for stakeholders to engage on various agenda items today. Uh, and when you registered for the meeting, you would have reg registered as a general participant, and you should see yourself uh, appear in the attendees window in the upper right-hand column of your screen. There's a separate, uh, separate box there. You'll be able to hear the meeting, but webcams and microphones uh, will be disabled by the organizers until those question and answer periods. Um, on the video strip across the top of the platform, you can see uh, all six commissioners, myself, and whomever will be presenting uh, throughout the day. Um, just a reminder, if there are any technical issues that you're encountering with your, with your access, no sound, for example, there is a help desk desk at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, so if you just type in your issue there, one of our tech team will be able to respond directly to you uh, and help assist resolve that problem with the meeting platform. Specifically, if you would like to ask a question or make a public comment on the agenda items that the chair has just highlighted, you need to click the blue text, which is sitting on the right-hand side, immediately beside the IPHC logo. You can see the uh, IPHC logo about the middle right-hand side of your screen. If you hit the public comment, comment questions sign up text, it will take you to um, a, a forum where you'll be able to enter your name, specify the agenda item of interest, and note whether you want to speak directly to the topic or whether you would like the Secretariat to read your question or comment aloud. So you have those two options to choose from. Should you choose to speak to a particular uh, agenda item, when you are called upon, uh, you'll be unmuted by our tech team, our, the organizers themselves. Um, make sure that your computer microphone is enabled and unmuted. Do a quick sound test before you start to ask your question, and we'll confirm that we can hear you loud and clear. You will then have three minutes to complete your comment, uh, and a signal light will be made available to you that will begin its green. It's currently shown on the screen at the moment as a green stage light in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, at, uh, once you have one minute remaining, it will turn orange. Once you have 15 seconds remaining, it will turn red. Uh, and we do ask you rapidly yeah, close hi, your Dave. comment Can you hear me? at that point in time. So just a, a reminder, uh, if you do look at uh, document 01, the 
third and fourth page specifically outline the schedule for the meeting and when those question and comment periods will be taken. Uh, all right. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, um, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. So uh, just going to confirm that there's no changes to the agenda. Um, we talked about that uh, earlier. So, Chris, I think we can, unless you had any opening comments that you wanted to provide, we could start with the uh, this morning's agenda. Can you mute us there, Paul? Okay. Dave, then I think we can get started. Do potentially have a have a sound issue. Uh, Commissioner Ryle, can you hear us? All right, thanks very much. Just going to uh, hold tight for another minute to see if Commissioner Rail can uh, reconnect with us. And if not, we'll move to uh, Commissioner Oliver. Do you have any questions for you? If you have questions, just um, raise your yes, hand. Yes, can. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, so we've completed the introduction for the Q&A and pass back to you to move to uh, adoption of the agenda. Thank you. Dave, I don't see any questions at this point. You could move on to the next item if you would. Uh, I don't have anything much. Good to see all of you again this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. So uh, I didn't have anything additional, Mr. Chairman. You can proceed. Thanks okay. very much, Thank Dave very much, and Lara, for that so um, update have, uh, on the um, agenda item three, which is uh, an update on the actions of rising. The 96th session of the IPAC annual meeting, uh, and in, in addition, the intercessional decisions that were made throughout the 2020. So I'll ask Secretary to bring up that presentation for paper 03, please. Thank you very much. So, a reminder this is uh, agenda item three, paper 03, on the interim meeting, uh, meeting page if you'd like to download the presentation. So the purpose uh, of this particular paper is, again, to provide the Commission with an opportunity to consider the progress made during the intercession period since uh, the last annual meeting which was held in February of, of this year. Uh, and in addition to that, to consider the range of intercession decisions that were made by the Commission in 2020 uh, following the revision to the IPAC rules and procedure, which uh, provided a more robust decision-making process intercessionally. A re reminder that the 90th session, the Commission made two specific recommendations and nine requests for direct action. Um, and I'm going to step through those uh, quite briefly in, in a short moment, noting that they will be uh, reported on in full at the annual meeting it's in terms of where we are completing those tasks. In addition, there were 15 intersessional decisions made throughout the course of 2020 uh, and uh, Almost all except one have been uh, completed. And again, I'm just going to walk through those very briefly at this time. Uh, as I mentioned, recommendations from AM96, the first to do with the space-time modeling of the IPAT Fishery Independent Satellite Survey. Um, and in particular, recommendation 01 was with a specific DART design for the FIS in 2020. This is reported out in uh, paper 06, and a reminder that the Commission, in one of its intercession decisions that we'll look at in about just a moment, modified that design uh, intercessionally due to COVID-19. The second recommendation, uh, again, 
was to relate it to the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey, and it was to go ahead with the regular query area 2A and 2B um, admission sampling components for the FIS, uh, primarily for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and then also for the DFO of Canada. Uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, revision to the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey in 2019, the modifications were implemented in May. Um, the two elements, addition components, were not progressed uh, in 2020, and we refer those to 2021. There were nine requests um, from AM96, and again, most of these uh, have been completed with, uh, I think there's two um, which are ongoing and two which are uh, pending. The ongoing are, uh, first of all, again, related to the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey, uh, and specifically, the Commission requested that the uh, Secretariat enhance the communication and review processes for the Fishery Independent Lent Set Line Survey uh, as the Commission moves to its cycle in 2020 and in preparation for 2021. So just as an update, uh, the FIS design work was presented for discussion uh, initially at the Research Advisory Board uh, one in, in February of this year, uh, and then in more detail at SRB, the Scientific Review, Review Board in June and subsequently in September. We also intend on expanding our stakeholder engagement following this meeting uh, in the lead up to the Commission's uh, final modifications that may occur to the Fishery Independent Supply and Survey at next year's annual meeting in January. We will also be working closely between now and then with various skippers who, and captains of vessels who will be actually contracted by the Fishery Independent Supply and Survey to ensure that uh, we are deploying the Fishery Independent Survey in the most efficient uh, means possible. In terms of the stock assessment or the uh, data review in particular, um, there is uh, was a request regarding the MSC process in particular to continue to evaluate the status quo management while also considering um, discard mortality in non directed fisheries. And Dr. Higgs is going to talk about that specifically in paper 11 uh, towards the end of today. Uh, and give an indication of how that's going to be delivered upon prior to AM 97 next year. The remainder of the recommendations or requests from AM 96 have all been completed and we've provided those to you in the paper and also in the presentation if you would like to um, cycle through those in detail. Uh, but very quickly, uh, recommend request 03 has been completed, and again, it's going to be addressed under Agenda Item 8.2, specifically uh, when we listen to the latest uh, advice arising from the Management Strategy Advisory Board from the co-chairs. In terms of the stakeholder statements uh, request, it's related to AM97, and so that uh, request is pending as we haven't yet received any stakeholder written comments related to any of the fishery regulation proposals. Um, and we'll get about that a little bit later this tomorrow morning when we get to review the current proposed proposals for the commission. Similarly for uh, the contracting party national reports from the USA, um, that is currently pending and we expect the uh, submission of the USA Contracting Party report 30 days prior to the annual meeting, so the 26th of December, where NOAA will uh, address the request from the Commission for more information surrounding uh, the Fishery Observer Program that's been uh, intending on being implemented in 2021 in particular, noting, of course, the difficulties uh, encountered in, in 2020 due to COVID 19. Rules of procedure were modified. Uh, and published on the 7th of February, 2020. The report, the second performance review, and specifically the recommendations that arose from that, uh, were considered at an intercession meeting on 17th of March uh, and adopted, and those will be covered in paper 13 uh, towards uh, the middle of, of, of tomorrow. Request eight on size limits was to provide uh, a new paper and uh, Dr. Stewart will speak to that uh, 
paper 09, uh, probably just before lunch today uh, and prior to the public comment period. Uh, and then finally from AM96, uh, just the standard uh, go ahead and publish and release publicly the report of AM96, which is on the 7th of February. Now, as I mentioned, there was a number of intercessional decisions made by the Commission this year, uh, and those are laid out in the various public, uh, public published rather uh, IPHC circulars. So, as this was a new process this year, quick reminder for stakeholders, you will see on our website a publication series called IPHC Circulars, and for intercessional decisions that were made or were going to be made next year by the Commission, you will also see a date range. Uh, which will be comprehensive and in series for the full calendar year. So in this case, this was IPHC Circular 07 and intercession decisions made between 1 January and 17 March when this circular was published. The first uh, intercession decision was related to the management strategy evaluation process. Um, that has been completed and I'm not going to speak to it in detail here. And again, it will be addressed under Agenda Item 8.2 uh, under the when you receive the uh, advice from the Management Strategy Advisory Board. Similarly, uh, intercession decision 02 related to reference SPR and fishing intensity. Again, this is in progress as we wrap up the initial management strategy uh, evaluation process and which will be reported out to you for AM96. Uh, and again, Dr. Hicks is going to speak, speak to this um, when he presents paper 11. The performance review, uh, as I covered earlier from the annual meeting, so that was considered and enforced um, in, as part of one of the intercession decisions on the 17th of March. Uh, and that, again, will be discussed under um, paper 11. Financial regulations were adopted by consensus uh, following discussion intercessionally, and those were published on the 17th of March and available on the IPHC website at the link provided on your screen. The Fishery Independence Setline Survey, uh, a modification that the Commission agreed to this year was to endorse the sale of the proportion of the fish catch of U32 fish. Uh, and again, we're going to report on this a little bit more later this morning, but as a quick update, uh, the sale of U32 fish that could not be returned to sea alive were landed and sold throughout the country this season uh, with a cost recovery component um, approximately uh, $65,000 with a unit price of $4.15 per pound. Uh, and again, as I said, we'll report out a little bit more when we talk about the implementation of the Fishery Independent Setline Survey this year. Intercessional decision 06 um, was related to a new FIS design that was agreed to in March, uh, immediately prior to the global pandemic um, lockdowns that occurred in Washington, but also elsewhere throughout the U.S. Uh, but uh, again, note that this was subsequently amended under intercession decision 11, which we'll get to in just a moment. Also intercessionally, the Commission uh, adopted uh, a couple of new fishery independent regulations or updates to the regulations. These were uh, adopted on the 20, 20th of May um, and uh, published in IPHC Fishery Regulation 2020 via the website. Specifically, this was related to the implementation um, of uh, Regulatory 2C reverse slot limit modifications and then also Regulatory Area 3A modification of the lower limit, of the lower size limit. In addition, a modified fishery regulation uh, adopted relating to Washington Sablefish Fishery uh, and again, this was published, amended and published as part of the uh, fish regulations on the 20th of May. Intercession decision 0909. So as a result of the uh, increase in intercessional meetings of the Commission and the associated decisions that were being made, the Commission has directed the Secretary to prepare draft guidelines for these intercessional meetings. Uh, and for these to complement the current IPHC rules and procedure. And we have uh, completed that task and provided it to you as paper 16, which we will discuss uh, later tomorrow for the second um, recommendation to, or adoption for AM96. 
second to last uh, was again uh, the adoption of the uh, final fishery specific halibut fishery regulations and for these to be published within uh, 24 hours notably the standard only minor editorial format name uh, and this was achieved with a special session report SSO7 which is uh, published on the IBAC website and subsequently the revised fishery regulations. The intercessional decision 11 was the final design that was adopted for 2020 and so this was adopted uh, on the 29th of May um, and it related to the uh, reduced fishery independent set line survey to core areas removing by parts of 2B, uh, all of four associated regulatory areas and uh, part of three as well. And so again, this is going to be reported out to you as paper 06 uh, by uh, Lara Erickson and Ray Webster in terms of the success uh, of that program. Intercessional decision 12 um, related to the Initiation, excuse me, initiation and approval of the fishery independent survey to occur between 1 July and with a target of 30th, 31st of August. Uh, and again, this was uh, completed within schedule, four days ahead of schedule, in fact, uh, and the fishery independent survey was wrapped up on the 9th of September this year. We also appointed uh, new uh, statement auditors to. Uh, for this year and the first step as part of that process was for our current auditor to be finalized the audits for FY 18 and 19 and the commission enforced that um, external auditor's report on the 11th of August. Uh, in addition the commission considered as part of intercessional decision 14 a modification to the fishing period for the regulatory area 2B commercial fishery where the fishery was extended to the 7th of December. Uh, and so just a reminder that uh, the fishery is, is currently closed, all areas extended to be, uh, which will close on the 7th of, of December. Uh, and again, this was published as part of revised fishery regulations on the 17th of December. Uh, and then as I, as I indicated, we have moved to new statement orders, uh, auditors, and the Commission uh, recommended and uh, appointed the external statement auditor, Moss Adams, to undertake our uh, statement audits for the next three years, um, starting with FY2020. And that process has already commenced, uh, and we expect the first audit report to be with us uh, within the next couple of weeks. So, Chair, we're simply asking for commissioners to note these updates and we'll Here. provide further um, updates to AM97. Uh, um, I'll understand. see if there's any questions from commissioners, either for you or for Lara. Thank you, Chair. Peter. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the report of the Secretariat, so paper 04, while that comes up on screen. Now just a, a reminder that this is a, a draft report. The final report of the Secretariat will be presented at uh, AM 97, so the deadline for that paper is 30 days prior, which is the 26th of December, and so you can expect to see the final report of the Secretariat on our activities for 2020 uh, at that point. Now, I'm going to be necessarily brief as, as it is a preliminary update um, and a reminder that this is just a quick update on those components which are not contained within other papers that are before you today and tomorrow. Uh, some of the staffing changes that have occurred at the Secretariat uh, this calendar year, we have uh, revitalized our former administrative services branch, which is now the finance and personnel services branch. We have a number of appointments um, from the from administrative specialist, information technology specialist, uh, senior staff accountants, and uh, accounting specialists. Those are the individuals shown on screen. We have Ms. Karen Sal, Ms. Clinton Hines, 
uh, Mr. Nicholas Wilson, Mr. Coluccio, and Mr. Vega Gerebelastari. Um, these individuals have all joined the, the Secretariat this year. Uh, we're very, uh, have been very impressed, very proud of the work that they have done in reforming the, the way that we uh, administer the Secretariat. So thank you and welcome to those individuals. The IPHC internship program, again, was a tremendous success despite the, um, the implications of a COVID-19 working environment. Mr. Adam Ziegler from Stonehill College in Massachusetts assisted the biological laboratory uh, in just determining the sex ratio in the commercial industry uh, throughout 2020. And so that project, <coughs> that project was, was a great success. Um, he also participated in feeding clip collection DNA purification um, and the like with our new uh, genetics lab. So again, thank you to Adam. Uh, it was a, again a, a great success, successful internship program for 2020 and we will continue to run that program throughout Glasgow. In terms of the IPAC Merit Scholarship, I'd like to thank the panel for reviewing and recommending Mr. Halen Bankenbakal as our successful uh, Merit Scholarship recipient for 2021. Um, Halen is uh, expected to attend Whitman College uh, in the very near future, um, and he will be receiving the standard bursary of $4,000 per year uh, for a maximum of, of, of uh, four years. Uh, and so congratulations, Halen, again, in uh, receiving the IPHC Merit Scholarship for 2020. A reminder that we run this scholarship program every two years, and so the next uh, Merit Scholarship recipient application process will occur um, in 2022. And uh, just a reminder as well, we still have Kai Dahl from Petersburg, Alaska, uh, who is due to the uh, wrapping up her Merit Scholarship and her associated degree. Um, in 2021. The report also just outlines very briefly a reminder of the uh, fishery regulations that were adopted in 2020. There were six. Uh, those are shown on screen. I'm, I'm not going to step through them, but they're there just for information. In terms of uh, interactions with contracting parties, at this point, I'm going to pass to Lara Erickson, who's going to- Hello, can you hear me now? So thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, in 2020, the IPHC Secretariat uh, has worked more closely with various representatives from contracting party agencies for both Canada and the United States of America. We are collaborating and working to identify any potential data gaps in reporting and to update data where possible. We are also working with the contracting party contracting party agencies to access similar and consistent data. Okay. To, sorry, we are also working with contracting party agencies to access similar and consistent data and exploring ways to more effectively report in season estimates. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the IPHC Secretary continues to work with contracting party agencies in Canada to address gaps in coverage for the IPHC Fishery Independent Setline Survey. And we are also working with agency staff to streamline this pro process where possible. Next slide, please. The IPHC Secretary worked with contracting party agencies in the United States of America to address gaps in coverage for the IPHC Fishery Independent Setline Survey. 
and successfully fish stations in Glacier Bay National Park in 2020, thereby eliminating any gaps in coverage in the waters of the United States of America. And the Secretary would like to extend a special thank you to NOAA Fishers John Lapore and Park staff for facilitating this work. And then I will return it to Dr. Wilson. Uh, a little bit of an issue there, a bit of an echo and a bit of a lag, so bear with us as we ensure we, we, we get the, the tech working correctly. Uh, in terms of abundance-based management at the Fisheries um, North Pacific Fisheries Management Council discussions, and in particular through the Abundance-Based Management Working Group, uh, Dr. Hicks is going to provide some, some update later today, closer to the end of the afternoon, on, on potential implications of that, uh, of that process. Uh, however, uh, as, as a brief update, uh, the Council considered its January-February meeting revised um, motion relating to uh, abundance-based management. Um, however, at the recent October meeting of the abundance-based management, while being identified as a priority agenda item, the Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed the operating model uh, and its associated results. Um, however, due to a misspecification, of directed commercial mortality in the model for 2019, the SSE didn't re recommend it up to the council uh, for consideration at this time. And so it has been um, passed back to the Abundance-Based Management Working Group for uh, additional work. Um, however, the council did um, make a number of uh, comments, and in particular a motion, which uh, includes uh, highlighting that they expect um, the abundance-based management work to be completed for final action in October of 2021. Uh, and we can certainly um, hear from the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council during the agency update uh, if there's been any more movement in that regard. In terms of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, uh, I'll pass back to Doc, uh, Lara Erickson to um, The IPC Secretariat continues to work with contracting party agencies in the United States of America and IPHC Regulatory Area 2A to collectively manage the various fisheries that take place there. Of note, the Secretary expressed concerns when the recreational fishery in California remained open for four additional days, even though it was estimated to have exceeded the applicable fishery limit. This fishery limit was exceeded by 64%. And the IPAC Secretariat has worked with the contracting party agencies on shifting the management of the Pacific halibut fisheries in this area from IPAC to the contracting party. In line with this work and these efforts, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council adopted for public review several steps to this end that are listed here. with um, multiple alternatives. And then the alternatives you see listed here are currently being considered at the Pacific Fishery Management Council November meeting. It's currently taking place as we speak. Of note, earlier this week, the um, Pacific Fishery Management Council approved the motion in support of the three-day fishing period limit that IPHC implemented this year, stating wide stakeholder support for this change and the benefit it brings to the local coastal communities. And then I will pass it back to Dr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Lara. Other activities we have been involved in, which are worth drawing your attention to, include uh, further significant enhancements of data availability and visualizations for particularly for the fishery independent set line survey but more broadly as well. These will be presented to you uh, later this morning but I, I, I would draw your attention to the publication of the 2020 fishery independent set line survey data uh, on the 27th of October via the IPHC website. If stakeholders have not had an opportunity yet to familiarize yourself with those visualizations and the ability to um, do individual uh, 
uh, searches and also downloads of the various uh, sections of the Fishery Independent Satellite Survey data, I do encourage you to do so over the next couple of days. It would help us greatly if you provide additional feedback into the utilization or utility rather of uh, that information. So please do take the time to have a look at those visualizations. Annual report was uh, published ahead of schedule uh, and is available on the IPHC website. Um, this was pre COVID-19 and so we do unfortunately have a number of hard copies here which we're not sending out to stakeholders, uh, but uh, the report is available online in PDF downloading. Uh, we do expect that the annual report for 2020 to be uh, published in the first week of March uh, next year. Continuing in that vein, in communications and outreach, the IPHC circular and media release format has continued. We are into fully electronic information distribution. Uh, it's it's uh, been very fortunate that we moved in that direction a number of years ago, and now in a COVID-19 operating environment where we are not sending any paper documents out from the IPHC secretariat, we have been well placed to provide uh, all of the information electronically to various stakeholders. So that's been a, a very fortunate and very useful uh, change to electronic uh, formats. While there is uh, traditionally a considerable amount of effort uh, put into public outreach uh, in any given calendar year and attending conferences and meetings, um, providing uh, engagement at various uh, scientific forums and also at uh, more broader educational or training events, um, due to COVID-19, these operation activities have been uh, substantially or significantly uh, reduced. So in 2020, for example, all of our communications and outreach of attending committees and external organizations since uh, the 23rd of March has moved to an electronic uh, engagement only. Uh, that said, I think it's actually been enhanced in, in many ways. It's allowing more stakeholders to engage, more secretariat to, ins to engage at um, the, the range of meetings that we would normally attend. Uh, I'm not going to step through these in great detail, but they're provided in the paper and it does give you an indication of the various committees and external organization appointments that we hold uh, and also the associated meetings that were held for those particular uh, organizations or committees. Uh, again, the physical conferences and symposia that were attended, there was only three, uh, and they end uh, the last closing on the uh, 12th of March, uh, immediately um, prior to the COVID-19 shutdown on the 23rd of March. And we have not attended any physical meetings uh, since that period. Uh, and realistically, we don't expect to be doing that again uh, until early next year at the very earliest. In terms of our public outreach, uh, again, we were only able to attend one activity, the Pacific Northwest Sportsman Show in February, again, prior to COVID-19, with all other activities uh, having been canceled for the remainder of the year. Uh, again, we are very well supported by uh, our academic affiliations, uh, particularly affiliate fac uh, faculty by Dr. Hicks, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Lannis. Uh, all of who are engaged as affiliate faculty at either the University of Washington or the Alaska Pacific University. Uh, and each of those participate in graduate student committee guiding those students uh, through their, their various degrees. I'm also very pleased to indicate that uh, for 2020 to date, we have 10 peer-reviewed uh, journal articles that have been uh, published for uh, with, as primary authors as shown on the screen and the authors will talk potentially talk or reference those during their presentations throughout the day, uh, with a number of six others that are um, have IPAC secretary staff as, as co-authors. We have uh, a number of others that are currently submitted under, um, under peer review with Dr. Planis and Dr. Stewart, uh, whether they're published in 20 or 20, 2020 or 2021, uh, time will tell. The rest of the document, or the last couple of slides, simply highlight some of the uh, peer review journal articles or the key articles uh, that are in preparation. And we, again, we, we expect these to either be submitted late this year or early next year. Uh, and each of these authors, uh, Dr. Planus, Dr. Sidoris, um, Mr. Sidoris, and uh, Anna Simeon will also do these a little bit about uh, when they make their various presentation on the research efforts associated with these papers. 
So Chair, all we're asking at this point is for the Commission to note the draft uh, Secretary report and that uh, we will be providing a further update, detailed update at AM 97. Um, Thank you, any Chair. Any other questions for either Dr. Wilson or Lara? I'm not seeing any, Dave. I think we can move on to um, agenda item five, State of the Fishery, which I think, Lara, you're presenting. Thanks very much, Lara. Um, are there any questions for Lara on the oh, presentation? Uh, of the, just uh, on the slide eight, history? if you can uh, scroll to slide eight. Uh, Bob. Sorry, it was just about the um, uh, the areas and I was curious if uh, the MPAs in question were specific to the Hackett Strait sponge reef or if they included uh, any of the MPA areas uh, within Guayanas or the rockfish protection zones and if if you guys were allowed to survey there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, through the chair, um, Commissioner Degree, we were able to fish in the Guayanas area. It is particular. It is in specific um, regard to the sponge reef area, which um, we are not able to fish in currently. Yeah, thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you very much for that clarification, Ma. Excuse me, what did you ask, Bob? Correct. Over to you, Lara. Here. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. So in 2020, let me advance this slide. Um, so in 2020, the total Pacific halibut mortality was projected to be 16,104 tons from all IPHC convention area waters. And just keeping in mind that all values presented here are in net weight and re represent removals for the entire calendar year. So this is through the 31st of December. So most of the coastwide removals came from the directed commercial fishery at 64%. This was then followed by the recreational fishery, which represented 17% of the removals. The non-directed commercial fishery was at 14%. And finally, the subsistence and fishery independent set line survey with IPHC research was at 3%. So in comparison, the 2019 removals, of almost 2,000 tons. Uh, reviewing changes in ratio, more of the 2020 removals were from the directed commercial fishery and less from the non-directed commercial fishery. Upon review of these removals in comparison to IPHC mortality limits, all removals were within the applicable limit for removals in Canada being 3% under and the United States of America being 6% under and 6% under for the entire IPHC convention area. On a closer review by fishery, the directed commercial fishery in Canada 
was open on the 14th of March and is still open, as Dr. Wilson mentioned, until the 7th of December. The removals are projected to be at the fishery limit of 2,322 um, tons given the season extension. In the United States of America, in IPAC Regulatory Area 2A for the Treaty Indian Fishery, 222 tons of Pacific halibut were landed following an unrestricted fishery, a restricted fishery, as well as a mop-up fishery. These landings were within 1% of the fishery limit. Um, just of note here, we did have some updates uh, recently from the tribes. The unrestricted fishery was extended through the 30th of September. Uh, the restricted fishery was extended to 222 hours from the 102 hours, and the mop-up or late fishery shifted to the 5th of October to the 18th of October, rather than the 1st of October. The non-treaty Indian fishery saw landings of 110 tons following five 58-hour fishing periods, with the first opening on the 22nd of June and closing for the season on the 19th of August. And these landings were estimated to be 5% under the limit. Landings of Pacific halibut from um, trolling were estimated at 13 tons, or 35% under the fishery limit, with no in-season action being taken. And landings of Pacific halibut by vessels with an incidental disabled fish license were estimated at 28 tons, or 12% under the fishery limit, with two in-season actions. The first action was to increase the ratio from 200 Pacific halibut pounds to every 1,000 pounds of sable fish to 250 Pacific halibut pounds to every 1,000 pounds of sable fish. The second action was an extension of this fishery through the 15th of November to match the commercial fishing period. Uh, and recently updated removals for this fishery, as it just closed on Sunday, are 29 tons, and it's now 9% under the fishery limit. In Alaska, the quota share fishery was open from the 14th of March through the 15th of November with projected landings at 7,192 tons, or 93% of the limit. And of note, in IPC Regulatory Area 2C, the United States of America allows for a fishery within the Annette Island Reserve. This fishery has no fishery limit, and within this fishery, 11, 11 tons of Pacific halibut were landed following eight two-day openings between the 12th of June and the 20th of September. So on the links displayed below on the screen, uh, and a, a quick look at the year-to-date details for 2017 through 2020, the coastwide 2020 removals were delayed for much of the season, with landings picking up and lining up with previous removals in the last few weeks of the fishery. And um, by selecting Canada only at these links, which you can do right here on the side when you go to the link, the landings have lined up well with removal trends from the previous three seasons. Um, noting these uh, graphs are out of date now because we had a recent update just on Monday for these details. And then by selecting Alaska, for the United States of America right here at these links. The landings were delayed throughout um, the most throughout most of the middle period, time period of the season, only picking up and lining up with the previous three seasons in the recent few weeks. So moving on to the recreational fishery by contracting party. In Canada, 2000, or 2020 removals are now projected at 236 tons, or at 59% of the lim limit, which is an update to the values you see here. Um, there was one in-season in action, which was to match the daily limit to the possession limit. And additionally, due to COVID-19, there was no experimental recreational quota fishery in place for 2020. 
In the United States of America, in IPHC regulatory area 2A, estimated removals were at 189 tons, or 69%. Recent reports from the contracting party state agencies have harvest in Oregon increased by less than a ton. And the recreational discard mortality in Washington State is at a slightly lower level than it was in 2019. So in Alaska, the recreational fishery is open from the 1st of February through the end of the calendar year. In IPHC regulatory area 2C, 227 tons of Pacific halibut were harvested in the charter sector, or guided fishery, coming in at 36% under the fishery limit. There was one in-season action in 2020 on the 20th of May. IPHC fishery regulations were revised to allow for a broader slot limit. Pacific halibut up to 45 inches in length may be retained from that point, where previously the lower length limit was 40 inches. And 25 tons were also harvested, um, 25 tons of Pacific halibut were also harvested uh, under as um, guided angler fish. So in IPHC regulatory area 3A, 724 tons of Pacific halibut were harvested in the charter sector or guided fishery coming in at 7% under the fishery limit. This, regular, or this regulatory area also had, saw some in-season action or an in-season action. Again on the 20th of May, IPHC fishery regulations were revised to increase the maximum size from 26 inches to 32 inches in length. And additionally, all day closures were removed as well as the annual limit. And approximately one ton was landed as guided angler fish in this IPHC regulatory area. In Alaska, private anglers harvested 1,310 tons with no fishery limit no annual limit and no size restriction. 526 tons were harvested in IPHC regulatory area 2C and 771 tons were harvested in IPHC regulatory area 3A with other IPHC regulatory areas accounting for the remaining 13 tons of Pacific halibut removals. In the subsistence fishery, coastwide removals of Pacific halibut represented 479 tons. In Canada, the removal estimate of 184 tons has been the same since 2007. In the United States of America, the West Coast removal estimate was 15 tons, which was updated most recently at the end of 2019. And the Alaska removals were 281 tons, with the estimate, estimate having been updated in 2018, apart from the CDQ portion, which is updated yearly. Non-directed commercial fisheries occur throughout the calendar year with associated discard mortality of Pacific halibut. Coastwide, these removals were estimated at 2,281 tons, which represents a decrease from estimated removals for 2019. Of these removals, 111 tons occurred in Canada. And in the United States of America, 49 tons occurred off the West Coast, and 2,121 tons of Pacific halibut died following capture in these fisheries. In Alaska, I should note the last amount. So um, IPHC research in the Fishery Independent Setline Survey removed 407 tons of Pacific halibut from the IPHC Convention Area waters, with removals of 89 tons in Canadian waters and 318 tons of removals from the waters of the United States of America. So all estimated removals by contracting party and by um, IPHC regulatory area were below the 2020 mortality limits, as you saw on an earlier slide. However, some removals were in excess of the applicable fishery limit or the fishery projection. In Canada, this was the case for the directed commercial discard mortality, which was projected at 59 tons 
and was estimated to be 75 tons in 2020. In the United States of America, removals of directed discard mortality in IPHC regulatory area 2A were above the projected level by 10%. Recreational fishery remo removals were also above fishery limits or projections in California by 64% and in several areas in Alaska. In the subsistence fishery, Pacific halibut removals were higher than projected in IPHC regulatory areas 4A and 4B. And regarding non-directed commercial discard mortalities, projection levels were exceeded in both IPHC regulatory area 2C and 4A. So the IPHC continues to have concern, or I should say the IPHC Secretariat continues to have concerns with the following mortality estimates. In the directed commercial fishery, the Secretariat has concerns with the discard mortality estimates with low observer coverage. In the recreational fishery, self-reporting by lodges in British Columbia and in Alaska is of concern. In the subsistence fishery, the lack of current estimates is of concern. And then finally, in the non-directed commercial fishery, the Secretary has concerns for these estimates with no update for these removals in Canada for 2020 and unaddressed low observer coverage in the United States of America. And um, so now for the port highlights for 2020. Um, as you may have noted during Dr. Wilson's presentation, 2019 tissue samples of Pacific halibut from the directed commercial fishery were pro processed in time for this year's assessment, um, thanks in part to our intern. And two questionnaires are ongoing for both the occurrence of chalk and the economic survey that is available on the IPHC website. In Canada, the Secretariat continues to work with the contracting party agencies and industry on adding marine mammal details to the logbook, which would bring these logbooks in line with the IPHC Pacific halibut logbooks in the United States of America. And of note, Prince Rupert saw fewer landings this year than in previous years with more landings occurring in Port Hardy. In the United States of America, ex-vessel prices were consistently reported to be low. Kodiak saw fewer landings than in previous years, likely due to the pandemic. And Dutch Harbor saw an increase in landings, which was likely in response to coastal community closures in the face of the pandemic. Whale depredation also remained a concern with increased interest in slinky pots. And I will touch more on the use of pot gear on slide 28. So updates for 2020 regarding the, require, the requirement to land Pacific halibut with the head intact. We again saw fresh landings of Pacific halibut with the head removed in Canada, which is a regulatory compliance concern. Landings of frozen Pacific halibut with the head removed were at similar levels in Canada in comparison to recent years. And again, no landings of Pacific halibut with the head removed were reported in the United States of America. And here you see the um, images of the slinky pots that are being used in the commercial fishery in Alaska. Reviewing the use of pot gear in the waters of the United States of America, landings from this gear are increasing, reaching 32 tons this year. However, the, le the level remains low, representing less than 1% of all landings. These are the faces of the IPHC Secretariat seen by many of our stakeholders and the work they do and the data they collect thanks to the support of our stakeholders feeds into much of the data I presented here and also feeds into the many of the presentations which will follow. Um, thank you, Chair, for your time.
Yeah, Laura, um, back on slide six, there's a picture of uh, caliber, and a couple of them have these red tags on the tails. Is that for marketing, or is that something IPNC is involved in? Yeah, Bob, they're provided um, the tag by a service provider, Archipelago, as I think is what Lara mentioned earlier. Um, Neil, I see you had your hand up. Yes, so oh, through the chair, Commissioner Alberson, these are indeed um, AMR or Archipelago Marine Research um, uh, tags that are put on in Canada on the Pacific halibut and every um, directed commercial fishery landed Pacific halibut receives this type of tag with the unique number to identify it. Good. Thank you. So is it, Paul, is, is that put on by the fisherman or, the, or at the processor level? Okay. So, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if, if those red tags are put on by the fishermen when they're uh, icing their own fish or are they at the processor level or when are those tags? Yes, thank you um, through the chair. Those, Commissioner Alberson, those tags are actually placed on the fish by an independent um, okay, party. Thanks, they uh, uh, they observe uh, the offload yeah. and they independently tag each fish. So it's neither by industry or by the fisherman himself, nor is it by Lara, DFO. It is question, actually by um, an independent maybe party. Maybe more just generally, what um, sort of issues you or um, staff out in the field may have experienced due to uh, any uh, COVID-19 requirements. But, so I guess more generally, were there things that had to change in the collection of data um, or any other issues that arose in collection of data because of uh, requirements to social distance or not being able to access uh, good morning, or everyone. anything like that? Laura, I had... Um, Question about the bycatch rates, uh, or sorry, the right, bycatch amounts, and was curious if we have any information to suggest whether they are due to a decrease in rates of bycatch or just due to um, the amounts of catch in those. Yeah, I'm going to move on then to the next agenda, item six. 6.1. the chair, Commissioner David. Our, um, our thought is that potentially it is due to oh, the decreased yeah. fisheries yeah, that we have seen Chris, during 2020 in those areas. Um, likely, as you are aware, there was a limited to no Pacific cod fishery in the Gulf of Alaska and limited in yeah. the Bering Sea as well. So we anticipate those removals to be reduced as a result of that. However, we have not investigated that to ascertain whether that is actually the case. Uh, no, that's fine, thanks. So, Lara, we can move on to 6.1. Thanks very much, Dr. Webster and Lara. Uh, questions for either Lara or Dr. Webster? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes. 
Um, there were definitely marked differences. I went to this slide here because you'll see in this picture that um, this is David Jackson who works for us in Kodiak. And he has a line that's down to the vessel with the bag on the end where he's asking the skipper to put his logbook in that bag. And then um, David Jackson is then pulling the bag up to then review the log and the details with him. So we absolutely saw changes in procedures. Um, we were quite strict um, with the IPHC secretariat in that uh, we limited their exposure. We, didn't, we had them conducting skipper interviews um, remotely rather than in person. And we had limited um, exposure for them at the plants. Um, on the Setline survey, we also required them to undergo the 14-day quarantine, even though that was no longer required by the state in Alaska. Um, we did have that requirement in place throughout the Setline survey season. Oh. Well, thank you, Chair. I believe Commissioner Oliver had a question. Yeah. I thought I had my hand up button, but I can't tell if you can see me. I think you can see me. But I click my buttons not. Uh, to Neil's question about my catch rates, I was curious about that too. I don't. I should, but I don't. Yeah, know the I answer, heard the but question, but it looks like we lost. Do you know that Dave answer? And Lara. Let me get that answer for you because I'm curious about it too. Just a quick question, Laura. Archipelago tags. Dr. Webster, is that something that you could address? A context for me. What are those tags for? Is it uh, tracking an independent industry? system or can you tell me a little bit more about that tag program yes through the chair um, I, I'd be happy to respond to it although probably commission um, the chair as well as Commissioner Davis could speak to it um, it's part of the uh, quota share program and as well as Commissioner degree it's part of the quota share program in Canada and when the program went into place, it was part of their requirements that they, um, and it was to validate every fish that came across the te across the dock, and to assure that um, there was only legally landed fish that was entering the marketplace. So that tag identifies every single Pacific halibut coming across the dock, and it ensures that if you receive halibut. At, in the market or somewhere, Pacific halibut in the market or um, from a buyer, that if it does not have that tag, then you know it is not a legally landed fish. Um, Chair, I, I hope I captured that effectively for Canada. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank can you I, very much. Can I add to that? RuPaul? Yeah, just uh, uh, it's paid for. Uh, we pay the service provider to uh, do that, and it helps with our chain of custody uh, and MSC uh, certification as well. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't have anything further. Thank you, Peter. Oh, no, I can't hear Paul. I'm sorry, what was that, Ray? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll just wait till the support team brings the presentation up. Yep, I can hear you, Lara. Go ahead, Lara.
So again, thank you, Chair. I will be, I will be presenting agenda item six, paper six, Rev one, along with Dr. Webster. And this is um, on the fishery independent set line survey design and implementation in 2020. So the primary objective of the set line survey is to collect fishery independent data for the Pacific halibut stock assessment, as well as the stock distribution estimation. Sorry, it took a bit to advance the slide. So 2020, um, marked the second year for the collection of individual Pacific halibut weights at sea on the scales that you see here. So lengths and weights were taken in concert. And then on the set line survey, all gear and bait are standardized. Fixed gear is used with each skate measuring 1,800 feet in length. Um, there's 100 hooks on each skate with 18 foot spacing and a size 16 hook. Um, in regard to the bait, the number two semi-bright um, chum salmon is used with each hook baited with a quarter to a third of a pound. And the set line survey captain confirms the quality of the bait that is used. So in 2020, 11 vessels were contracted, fishing 951 stations that you see marked here in IPHC regulatory areas 2B, 2C, 3A, and 3B. We also conducted a gear comparison study in IPHC regulatory area 2B. The gear comparison study was conducted in the St. James Charter Region in IPHC regulatory area 2B with each station being fished twice, once with fixed gear and once with snap gear. This study has the potential of increasing the number of vessels available to the set line survey, and it also recognizes the increase this gear type of uh, this gear type in the directed commercial fishery. This is a map of the charter region and the stations. Uh, the timing that you see here, that's indicated here, is for the fix is for fixed gear. So the timing uh, for the snap gear would be the opposite of this. This map depicts the stations that were found to be ineffective for various reasons. There are four stations also on this map that were deemed effective, even though orca whales were observed. And you can see those with the triangles here. The secondary objective of the set line survey is uh, long-term revenue neutrality. In line with this, we improve the um, fish sale process with the request for tender for each sale. All submissions were evaluated against specific criteria with price being the primary consideration. Controls were also in place and followed and buyers were invoiced for every sale or any sale. Uh, regarding vessel charter agreements, a call for request for tenders was sent out and posted on our website. And again, all submissions were rated against specified criteria with price being the main consideration. Now, as um, Dr. Wilson had mentioned in, an, in the earlier presentation, um, U32 Pacific halibut that were sampled were retained and sold. And the prices that we saw for those, for those fish were very similar to the prices we saw for O32 fish in the 10 to 20 category for, 2000, or for 2020. Tertiary objectives include work with contracting party agencies on a cost recovery basis. Of note, due to COVID-19, none of these were conducted in 2020. However, discussions are currently underway for this work to potentially resume in 2021.
The links here allow any user to access the fishery independent set line survey data with respect to Pacific halibut, CPUE, you'll see on the top link here, um, followed by the set line survey performance, so how effective the stations were that we fished, and the fishery independent set line survey biologicals, which is primarily Pacific halibut biological details, and as well as data downloads and data on non-Pacific halibut catches. And then currently, the Secretariat is updating the tender specifications for the 2020 Fishery Independent Set Line Survey. Um, the tender specifications will for, be further simplified and will outline specific communication needs as well as associated costs. And the 2021 specifications will be online next month, so December of 2020. And submissions will be due by the 31st of January 2021. And at this point, I will advance one more slide and then turn the presentation over to Dr. Webster. Thank you, Lara. So um, here I'll briefly present some of the results from the space time modeling that was undertaken on the um, fish data um, that we yeah. received this year. I assume they I can start on with I'll continue. Um, so as in 2016 to 2019, space-time modeling was used to estimate O32 and all sizes weight per unit effort indices, and all sizes numbers per unit effort indices from 1993 onwards to 2020. These estimates are computed for biological regions, IPHE regulatory areas, and for coastwide IPHE convention waters from San Francisco Bay to the Bering Strait. And um, my colleague, Dr. Stewart, will go into many of these results in more detail in his presentation. But here is a summary by biological region of O32 weight per unit effort time series, um, with the number in the lower left hand corner representing the percentage change in the index from 19, uh, 2019 to 2020. And so we can see by biological region, uh, region three had a 16% increase in O32 weight per unit effort, um, which was the largest increase. Region two had a 7% decrease. And um, there was no sampling in region 4B. So what we're seeing there in um, that region is essentially noise. It's just a, a small drift in the, in the time series. We'll also see. Um, Error down here. Um, if you look closely, that the uncertainty increases in the terminal point. We had no survey, as I mentioned, in Region 4B, um, so we have uh, a, a meaningless increase and um, a lot of uncertainty about that value um, for 2020. But we had um, information for Region 2 and Region 3, as Laura outlined. Region 4 is um, the combination of 4A and the bearing in um, 4TDE. And that um, region had a small amount of data collected this year from Alaska Department of Fish and Game Control Survey in Norton Sound. Um, but again, there is greater uncertainty in the terminal year in Region 4 as well. Moving on to um, all sizes numbers per unit effort by biological region. Again, Dr. Stewart will talk about this in more detail. But um, essentially, this index was a coastwide level was stable for 2020 um, and was up slightly in 3A and down somewhat in, in region, uh, sorry, in um, region 3, down somewhat in region 2. Lara mentioned the gear comparison study that we undertook in regulatory area 2B in 2020. The space time modeling, um, the results of which some of which you just saw, included parameters allowing for gear differences in catch rates, as we did in the 2019 study in regulatory area 2C. And the results of the 2020 study were generally consistent with the 2019 study. The average weight per unit effort and numbers per unit effort indices were lower on snap gear, ranging from 72 to 83 percent of fixed gear average, depending on the index. Um, we estimated 86 percent across all indices 
as that ratio in 2019 in CC. While that's slightly lower um, on average than the value we got in 2019, there's quite a lot of uncertainty in these estimates. Um, particularly in 2020, this was a relatively small study, and all 95% intervals in fact included 100%, that the ratio of the two gear types um, catch rates was 100%. In other words, there were no differences in the catch rate. So further studies are being planned to collect additional data because of the high uncertainty. Um, and we also need to better understand the relative efficiency of the gears, get a more precise estimates of these ratios, and to understand um, the potential variability over time and space. We've looked so far only in regulatory area two. We've had some values that are consistent with each other, albeit with somewhat um, larger uncertainty than is desirable. But um, to um, generalize these results, we need to do additional sampling elsewhere. And future modeling will work to combine data across multiple regulatory areas to um, improve the precision of the estimates by, um, by um, aggregating the data, and also to test whether there, are, whether there is evidence for differences in these rate ratios um, among, um, across space. And that is. I have for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, question about whale depredation pursuant to slide eight. I, I don't think you need to pull the slide up because my question is really general. And okay, that is thanks, Chris. Um, the overall Neil. percentage of the stations were obviated by whale depredation, for lack of a better way to put it. 10, 21, 1%, 10%. Ballpark. Were you able to hear me? I'm sorry, were you able to hear me, Mr. Chairman? To the chair, can you hear me now? Thank you, Chair. My apologies, I the exact value for that. Are you able to hear me? Momentary out. So, um, yes, the, the number of stations were deemed ineffective were less than 3% for the set line survey. That answers my question. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm using headphones. Hopefully this is better for the feedback. Um, I had two questions. Uh, Perhaps both for Dr. Webster. Um, for the SNAP fixed gear study, just curious about your thoughts about why the uncertainty was so large. And then All right. my Thanks, second Dr. question Webster. was to get a little questions? bit in the first agenda item about um, plans for sort of engagement and development of survey design looking ahead to 2021. And if this is planned for later in our agenda, we can always come back to it. But I was curious if we intended in the meeting today or tomorrow to um, talk about what we think that is shaping up like in terms of steps and time frames. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Uh, 
So the, the first question, uh, this was a relatively small study in 2020 um, for um, year comparison. Um, I believe there were 56 stations together. And you know, catch rates vary quite a bit from station to station. It can and vary um, in successive fishings of the same station. Um, and so with such a small study, there's going to be a fair amount of uncertainty associated with estimating an index. We get precise est estimates of indices based on, um, at a regulatory area level, because we have hundreds of stations um, generally at each regulatory area. But when we're dealing with 56 stations, there's going to be quite a bit of uncertainty. So in this relatively small study, it wasn't surprising that we had wide um, in intervals indicating high uncertainty among the around the estimates. Well, the second question on plans for engagement, um, you're correct. That is going to be part of my subsequent presentation, and probably um, as there is a slide on that, that would probably be a good focus for that discussion. Thanks, Dr. Webster. Um, Peter. It does. Thank you. I guess um, sort of looking ahead. Uh, perhaps interested to hear about um, whether there are plans to adjust the, the scope of those comparison studies to address that variability, or or if uh, we, Dr. Webster thinks that we can still draw some useful information from the way it's currently constructed. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. To follow up, um, we do have plans for an additional study in. 2021. Um, once we've done a number of these, uh, well, in, in fact, with the 2B and 2C study, I do have plans um, when time allows to fit some models which combine the data from both of those studies. And in 2C in 2019, we had intervals that fairly touched 100%, um, so it, which, which was somewhat narrower than what we got in 2020. Combining data, if we can, from both of those studies would allow precision, these estimates to be made with greater precision. Um, and collecting additional data from elsewhere will allow us not only to um, get estimates. I don't know, um, more Dr. Webster, is that something you can address? Ratios that, that are perhaps um, consistent um, spatially, if that is the case. So two things is, so and the two things we can do to improve precision. Yeah. Data, one, of course, collect more data. Mm. Two, um, fit models which make use of all the data together. And those are both things that we have um, planned. Looks like we've lost Lara. Um, Dr. Webster, is that something you can address? Oh, wait. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, my question is on slide seven. You showed um, the um, Guayanas, and or you didn't have Guayanas marked on there as a, a marine park. Um, that should probably be in there, I think. And as well, which stations um, were discounted or could not be used? Uh, just All right, I don't all see the numbers any right there. I know there's a um, um, an area gonna, right around the. Uh, recommend that we take a break that, now uh, for 15 minutes use. and we'll reconvene um, at 10 if it's directly five. in it or so if you were able to we'll do some of the stations on the outlying uh, edges of the MPA. the chair. Um, yes, the uh, stations that are 
well within the conservation area, we're not able to fish. However, if you look at the stations that are right on the edge, um, we are able to fish those by following our protocols of moving them three, um, within no more than three nautical miles. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other, well, I have a number of questions, but um, just on the next slide, on slide eight, <clears throat> um, I was under under the understanding that uh, one of the um, uh, surveys had to be redone for soak time greater than 24 hours within 2B, and that was in the um, the um, the gear comparison study. And I'm just Curious if that's correct. Yes, through the chair, that is correct. Um, it was part. It was actually on the vessel that was fishing with snap gear. The uh, the soak time did exceed the 24 hours, which, as you know, is um, doesn't meet the set line survey criteria. So as a result, they waited the required amount of time and they refished that station to make it effective. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious as to why it's not listed here. Is that because you're only using data from the fixed? Uh, just, just curious. It is. It is used. It is listed. There. Well, no, actually, you're right. The it would not be because this would be from just the fixed gear amount. Um, but you can see stations that are listed there um, that didn't meet the soak time criteria. Um, Although we don't then indicate whether the station was refished to then allow for it to be effective on this map currently. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one other comment, just on the uh, U32. I don't know this. This is for you, Laura, but um, well done. I'm glad to see we're not wasting those fish, and they came in at a value. Um, uh, very good cost recovery. Um, I just want to ensure that that's moving forward. We're continuing with um, uh, selling the U32 that are going to be dead. I just want to make sure we're continuing that. I'm not sure if that was a. Um, um, yes, through the chair. Thank you again, Commissioner Degree. But that is certainly our intent is to continue selling those fish. Okay, thank you very much. Again, well done. Um, and one last question for Ray. Um, I have slide 17. I don't think it really matters, but um, I, going through some of the numbers, uh, I noticed the uh, catch rates were, um, or you said the catch rates were very similar. I'm just curious why the weight per unit effort and the numbers per unit effort uh, would be so much lower. Is that strictly due to hook competition, or am I kind of missing something here? I'm, I'm not quite following that. I don't have an explanation for that at present, um, but I do note that these numbers, while they are different, are well, the differences are well within the uncertainty of the estimate. Um, I think the I believe it's in the, in the um, revised report. I don't have it in front of me, but I believe the uncertainty, um, the, the, comp, the um, intervals range from somewhere like 55% or 60% up to um, 110, 15%, something like that. So 72 to 83%, there is no meaningful difference between those numbers. So I haven't looked at the data closely enough to see what it is in the data that's leading to that, but um, it's not something that, um, Troubles me given the uncertainty um, around these values. Okay, I just uh, I just noted that the uh, the snap boat uh, delivered fifty six thousand pounds, and the other fixed vessel delivered fifty thousand pounds. So I I just didn't understand myself. Um, we can, but. Uh, um,
Are we just waiting for people to reconvene, Dave? No, they're just doing the, the transfer across of all commissioners, so we're almost there, halfway there, rather. Okay. Um, Chair, it just looks like we have a slight delay with transferring of two commissioners into the room, so bear with us. Okay. Okay, uh, I think we're good there. Can we just do a sound check with Commissioner Oliver? Looks like we're like we're all here, Dave. Yes, uh, go ahead, a chair, as you see. So, are we going to be transferred back into the meeting room, or are we now? Can you hear me? Okay. But there does seem to be an issue. But uh, yes, we're in the room now, Chair, so we can go ahead. All right. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, just before we get started, I uh, just wanted to remind people in the meeting that there is a <coughs> form to complete that if you want to make public comment, it's um, there's a the IPHC logo, the Halibut logo is uh, on the left hand side of the page, and then there says public comment and questions sign up. So if you click on that, you will be able to submit your questions or comments that you may have, which we will then address in the public comment and question period that we'll <clears throat> do uh, before lunch. So I think now we're moving on to agenda item uh, 6.3, which is back to Dr. Webster.
Thank you. Um, I turned my microphone up, so hopefully I'm a bit easier to hear um, this time around. Um, okay. So this presentation is on the rationalization of the FIS following the 2014 to 19 expansion series. And this follows um, similar presentations at um, the last interim and annual meeting but where um, things are developed a bit further in terms of the process involved going forwards. So in summary, um, I'll begin with some background information, um, history of the IPHC FIS from 1993 to 2010, the expansion series from 2011 to 2019, a, a brief review of space-time modeling and its purpose, um, our design objectives when designing the FIS, and um, the review process going forwards. Uh, then we have the proposed designs for 2021 to 2023, and the evaluation and revision, um, the process of evaluation and revision of designs, and discussion and consideration of cost. So the FIS is our most important data source um, on Pacific halibut. It provides data for estimating weight and numbers per unit effort, indices of density and abundance. These are used to estimate stock trends and are used to estimate the stock distribution among regulatory areas or regions. Um, and they're important input into the IPHC stock assessment. Further, the FIS provides biological data for use in the stock assessment. A standardized FIS has been conducted by the IPHC each year since 1993, standardized for bait and fishing gear. From 1993 to 97, coverage was limited and generally restricted to IPHC regulatory areas 2B, 2C, 3A, and 3B. Um, even then, coverage was not consistent um, each year, and not all of each regulatory area was sampled when a regulatory area was sampled. The modern FIS design on the 10 nautical mile grid that we're now familiar with began in 1998. And by 2001, annual coverage, annual coverage occurred in all IPHC regulatory areas, with a depth range of 20 to 275 fathoms in the Gulf of Alaska and Aleutian Islands, and 75 to 275 fathoms along the Bering Sea shelf edge. By 2010, data from other sources showed that not all Pacific halibut habitat was covered by the FIS. And in particular, Pacific halibut were present outside of the FIS depth range in both deep and shallow waters, so waters from 275 um, fathoms and deeper, and water shallower than 20 fathoms. And all IPHC regulatory areas had coverage gaps, even within the standard depth range. And in some, some of those areas, the coverage gaps were quite large. Such unsampled habitat meant there was potential for bias in the estimates derived from the FIS data. It could be that the average catch rates, the average densities were higher or lower in the areas that we weren't sampling. We actually found that to be true. Um, this led the, the um, Secretary to propose expanding FIS coverage to include the unsurveyed habitat. We began with pilot expansions in IPHE regulatory area 2A in 2011. We expanded to include deep and shallow waters, deep going down to 400 fathoms, based on um, commercial data showing no catch, no um, meaningful catches of fish below 400 fathoms, and shallow waters um, up to 10 fathoms. Shallower than 10 fathoms was logistically um, difficult for a uh, long line gear to fish. Um, other, and other missing, missing stations. And in 2013, we expanded into Northern California based on information um, that showed that there were um, Pacific halibut present there. From 2014 to 2019, a planned program of expansions took place in all IPHC regulatory areas. And um, as follows, with the previously unsampled proportion of stations in parentheses. So in 2014, we fished um, expansions in 2A and 4A. In 4A, the expansion was 42% of the stations that we currently consider the full um, grid in 4A. So we were missing 42% of the habitat. In 2015, we, um, we fished um, the Eastern Bering Sea Flats in regulatory of 4CDE, which is actually a repeat of an expansion first done in 2006, which is used to provide information for a calibration between our survey and the NIMPS troll survey, um, which occurs throughout the um, Eastern Bering Sea on an annual basis, typically. 
In 2016, we expanded again in the Bering Sea up to the shelf edge, and that led to um, sampling 62% of stations that um, are now part of the full grid. In 2017, uh, we visited 2A again, expanding further into California, and, um, and, and 4B. In, and in 4B, the, station, the expansion stations are a majority of the stations in that regulatory area. So previously, the unfished habitat accounted for more than half the habitat. In 2018, we went to 2B and 2C. And, and um, last year, we finished off our series of expansions in 3A and 3B. So overall, during the expansions, the FIS occupied for the first time 34% of the stations on the full 10 nautical, 10 nautical mile grid that had previously been unsampled. So fully a third of the habitat was not being sampled by the survey prior to this series of expansions. And the result was an improved understanding of Pacific halibut density and distribution throughout its range um, in Canadian and American waters. It's reduced bias in our estimates with indices for several regulatory areas being revised upwards or downwards, depending on the new information. Uncertainty in estimates of weight per effort and numbers per effort was reduced in most regulatory areas. These improvements were apparent throughout the time series, not only in the year of the expansion. This resulted in an expanded grid of 1,890 stations, which provides a full FIS design from which stations can be selected for sampling in each annual FIS. And I should note that these improvements um, that we saw um, the first time we visited these areas, we don't expect the same degree of um, change as we revisit them in subsequent years. Um, our first look of data provided us some baseline information. And going forwards, we'd expect um, more minor revisions as we revisit these areas. So the full FIS grid looks like this. And these are the orange stations, um, as you can see, ranging from Northern California. Let me get my little green arrow somewhere. There it is. Um, ranging from um, just outside San Francisco Bay all the way up to the EZ line with Russia in the Bering Sea. And those are the 1,890 fist stations on the 10 by 10 nautical mile grid within the depth range of 10 to 400 fathoms, or 18 to, 7, 18 to 732 meters. Um, our survey data is augmented by information from trawl surveys in the Bering Sea, where we're not able to fish an annual survey. And in some areas, we've never fished an IPHC set line survey. And so um, the 2019 NIMS trawl survey, um, the stations that we use for our uh, calibration and for our um, estimation are indicated in blue. And we also use data for, from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Control Survey in Northern Sound, and that's indicated in with the red stations. And those in the last few years have also been fished on an annual basis. Um, I may mention this later, but in 2020, um, the NIMS did not fish their troll survey in the Bering Sea, so we lack that information as well as our own uh, in, um, data from the Bering Sea. But we do have data from the NIMS, Alaska Depart sorry, from the Alaska Department of Fishing Game troll survey in um, Northern Sound. So we do have some information, particularly on fish in the northern, most northern part of it, um, the Pacific Halibut Range. Taken together, we have a comprehensive look each year um, in, in a typical year of the distribution of halibut throughout the range um, in the two treaty partner countries. And these data are compiled um, within space-time modeling and have been done so since 2016 to produce weight per unit effort and numbers per unit effort um, indice estimates. And the modeling has two key purposes. It smooths the data in time and space and makes use of information on spatial and temporal relationships among survey stations to sort the signal from the noise, trying to get at the underlying density of Pacific halibut. Um, and it fills in gaps in survey coverage using model predictions while accounting for uncertainty. So any region or component of a regulatory area that we don't survey in a particular, area, particular year will still be estimated. The weight unit effort or numbers unit effort will still be estimated for that unsurveyed region. And the information that's used for that is um, 
comes from the, the relationships previously estimated in the model. For example, we have depth relationships, um, an understanding of how Pacific halibut um, varies with depth, and also the spatial relationship um, and temporal relationship between the unsurveyed components and um, nearby stations or previous um, uh, information from those unsurveyed areas. And the Scientific Review Board has repeatedly endorsed the space-time modeling approach for, um, for producing these estimates. And the methods themselves have been published in um, peer review journal in 2020, the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Science. And in a paper that was focused on the Bering Sea, but the methods were the same for all, essentially um, same for all IPHU or the tree areas. Now, in working through um, developing designs going forward, it has helped us to have some objectives and corresponding design layers to guide us. And our primary objective is, is the scientific one. And that's the sample Pacific halibut for stock assessment and stock distribution estimation. And the design layer associated with that is um, the minimum sampling requirements in terms of the station distribution, which stations are we going to fish, how many stations we're going to fish, how many skates per station are we going to fish each year? We have an important secondary um, objective, and that's to achieve long-term revenue neutrality. And that um, objective guides for the logistics and costs of the operation. So we need to have operational feasibility, and um, we need to fish stations in a way, the number of stations, the location of stations, the number of skates, and so on, in a way that achieves the goals of cost and revenue neutrality. And we have tertiary objectives, which is minimizing the removals, the, the impact of the um, survey on the, on the stock, um, and assisting others where feasible on a cost recovery basis. So if, if other agencies um, would like to piggyback on our platform, then that's something that um, we um, are um, amenable to on a cost recovery basis. And also IPHC policies. There can be ad hoc decisions of the commission regarding the FIST design for reasons other than um, the primary and secondary reason, um, um, objectives. So based on these objectives, the IPHC Secretariat has developed methods for evaluating potential future FIST designs and presented these proposed, method, uh, proposed designs for review. So these evaluation methods, um, which is a means of assessing the designs in terms of um, are they delivering the quality of the data that we need for scientific purposes. Um, these methods were reviewed at um, um, SRB meetings over the last two years. And the designs that resulted from those methods and from those reviews were prevent, presented for 2020 to 2022 at IM95 and IM96. And at um, the previous annual meeting, 96, commissioners adopted an enhanced version of one of the proposed designs. Ultimately, that was not the design that was implemented for a number of reasons that you're aware of. Um, following the completion of the coastwide FIS expansion efforts, 2019-20 was the first year fully rationalized, rationalized designs could be proposed. We needed that information from regulatory, regulatory areas um, 3A and 3B, the expansions that were undertaken there in 2019, to be able to proceed with um, fully rationalized um, designs. So beginning in 2020, it's expected that the design proposal and review process going forward will be as follows. Um, the IPHC Secretariat will present design proposals to the SRB for three subsequent years at the June meeting. And we did this in 2020 for the 2021 to 2023 designs. The first review of design proposals by commissioners will be at the September work meeting, revised if necessary based on SRB input. And this was also completed for the subsequent three years designs um, in September this year. Uh, we will present the proposed designs at the November interim meeting, which is this presentation today. And these designs presented and will be pre and designs presented um, Designs will be presented and potentially modified at the January-February annual meeting given commissioner direction, as was um, the case for the first time in um, February this year, which we presented the designs and they were modified by the commissioner. The adopted annual meeting design for the current year, which 
current year we're talking about here is 2021. Um, modified can be modified then for cost and logistical reasons prior to summer implementation in the FIS, and that can happen over the February April period, or um, we can consider cost and logistical um, considerations prior to that as well. And as you're aware, some modification occurred during that period um, for those reasons in 2020, and then subsequently there were further changes um, when um, it became clear um, of the impact of COVID-19. Stakeholder input. Um, consultation with industry and stakeholders occurs throughout the FISC planning process. This input is particularly valuable in finalizing design details as part of the FISC charter bid process. The stations can be added to provide for logistical efficiency. Um, in developing the expansions, we, we depended um, a lot on the input of, of, um, of stakeholders, particularly the uh, vessels involved in the charter process, to um, provide us information on the log logistical feasibility um, of the designs that we were interested in and um, how to, to implement those. And um, my colleague, Lara Erickson, um, um, has more information on that um, side of things. We also note that there are opportunities for stakeholder input during public meetings, this meeting, the interim meeting, and the annual meetings. And there was extensive stakeholder input at the annual meeting in 2020. And also through the IPHE's Research Advisory Board, which meets in February. And as noted previously by Dr. Wilson, we did present the um, the designs and discussion at this year's uh, 2020 Research Advisory Board meeting. I know there'll be follow-up questions on this um, coming coming up, but I um, um, first I wish to present this review process in a schematic to help maybe clarify how things fit together. There are really two components to this. There's the review process itself, which I've just outlined, and the analysis that feeds into that review process. And I've started this timeline in March, because that's essentially the beginning of the, the next three-year cycle in developing designs. And so following the annual meeting and the finalization of the design for current year, in this case, 2021 will be the next um, year, we can develop now with that design in hand, we can develop and revise designs for the next three years with an understanding of what data we will expect to collect in the current year, and therefore what our needs will be going forward. Are there gaps that we need to then um, fill next year because we didn't do them, we're not doing them this year, and, and so on in subsequent years. And so that will be the analytical part of the review process where we look at the designs, ensure that we are getting data that is sufficiently precise and has a low chance of, of bias, um, and um, is, is the, it has the quality that we need for um, for our purposes, stock assessment and stock distribution estimation. Um, that process ends near the middle end of May, which is when documents are due for the SRB review. And a month from that in June, when the SRB meets, they will um, get to review the designs that we've developed and the process and the analysis underlying those designs. They may recommend further work, which will be undertaken in the subsequent two months leading up to um, the key date for documents for the work meeting in September, which is when the commissioners will first see um, the designs for the subsequent three years. Now, then there's a, a sort of a cutoff at the um, end of um, uh, September when new data come forward, um, when the data for the current year um, are become available. And I will flip to the next slide to indicate that, Mark, because I think it was not entirely clear at previous presentations, particularly at the SRB, that up until the end of September, we are working with data from the previous years. We don't have, so for when we're working in 2020 on developing designs for 2021 to 2023, we didn't have the data for 2020 in hand. And that will be true going forward. We need to have these designs developed prior to the availability of the data in the current year. And so it's not until this um, point at the end of September that um, we begin the analysis of the current year's data, and the results of which are generally not available until later in um, October. 
Um, okay, so that's the bracketed region here, modeling of the FIST data. And we do some um, evaluation here. We can compare projected and estimated coefficients of variation to see if some of, some components of our evaluation are um, are uh, as um, proceeding as we hope. And then we have the IM review of the um, design proposals and the um, and then the AM decision, and then possibly some subsequent revision in February based on costs and logistics. So that's the timeline for the review process as um, we see it. Um, and this is the timeline we followed for the first time um, in 2020. So the proposed designs for 2021 to 2023, um, due to budgetary constraints and the impact of COVID, neither, neither the proposed nor the adopted annual meeting designs were implemented in 2020. Instead, sampling was conducted within the core areas 2B, 2C, 3A, and 3B for the 2020 fifths. And it turned out um, that um, you know, this is the core areas comprise the bulk of the stock, and that the survey was was a success, and we've got the vast majority of the data that we need, and we still have precise estimates and um, um, high quality information feeding to the stock assessment. So we consider ourselves, I consider myself very lucky and privileged to be able to have such high quality data in such a challenging year for analysis when many agencies have nothing of approaching this. But because of this, a proposal for 2021 to 2023 um, changed. We did not fish the design that we had anticipated originally when we came up with the three-year proposals um, and presented them at the annual meeting. So our proposal for the subsequent three years was to shift our original 2020 to 2022 proposal um, which was presented at AM96 to be implemented instead in the subsequent three years. And this design used efficient sub-area sampling in IPHE regulatory areas 2A, 4A, and 4B, but incorporates a randomized design in IPHE regulatory areas 2B, 2C, and 3A. And it's likely this design represent, represents the maximum effort that can be deployed outside of the core areas in coming years while still meeting the secondary objective of cost and logistics. And this is the design um, proposal for 2021. My green arrow again, there it is. And so from 2B through 3B, from west coast of Vancouver Island, um, all th um, in 2B to 2C, 3A, and 3B, excluding the inside waters of 2B, we propose a randomized um, subsampling of stations, but at a, a fairly high sampling rate of over 50% in those regulatory areas. In regulatory areas 2A, 4A, and 4B, we're proposing sampling the most dense um, areas of Pacific halibut habitat only. Um, those are the areas with the greatest um, density. They're also the areas with the highest variability and so are the most important areas to fish in terms of getting precise estimates from those regulatory areas, given that um, logistics and costs prevent us from fishing everything. In 4CD, we've proposed again um, that we fish all IPHC fish stations in regulatory of 4CDE. This is a very dynamic regulatory area. Much of it has not been fished by us, particularly in the north, since 2016. Yet um, other sources of information, particularly the NIMS Troll Survey, shows that halibut seem to be um, the center of biomass of Pacific halibut in that region is moving northwards. And so, um, this is an area that is, is changing over relatively short, appears to be changing over relatively short time frames, and it would seem um, prudent to um, get updated data um, as soon as possible from our own stations in that regulatory area. For 2022, um, we're proposing a very similar design to the 2020 um, one design. Um, again, randomized in from 2B through 3B, although fishing any station that we hadn't fished in 2021. And um, I think it's essentially the same areas outside of those regulatory areas. Again, targeting the key parts of those regulatory areas. Um, our analysis shows that these areas in purple, which we are not planning to fish in 2021 or 2022, are either relatively stable or low, low in density and do not require um, fishing on an annual basis. But 
as we move to 2023, we start to fill in some of those gaps. Um, our 2023 proposal includes fishing the unsurveyed part of um, 4B, which we um, would not have surveyed any of um, previously since 2019, um, and other parts of the edge part of 4A. Um, 2A, again, is the same because we believe these parts to be stable, but the, the unsurveyed parts would then be surveyed in subsequent years, 2024 or 2025, depending on um, on the component of 2A, um, but at a longer time scale for the very low density area in California. And likewise, the inside waters of 2B require less frequent sampling as well. But we have a plan for sampling those over subsequent years. And so the proposed designs have high sampling rates in regulatory areas 2B, 2C, 3A, 3B, and 4CDE, which has 100% sampling. And so we expect coefficients of variation, which is a measure of relative variability, it's the variance, the standard deviation divided by the mean, um, to remain within our, our, um, our limits, the limits we want to maintain for data quality. And that's 15% per regulatory area. So analysis shows that um, those high sampling rates will, in those regulatory areas, will maintain that level of data quality. Randomized and, and randomized or full sampling designs will um, lead to unbiased estimation. In other regulatory areas, we propose, we project that the designs we proposed will lead to the following coefficients of variation following completion of the 2023 design. And so, bearing in mind that we aim to keep the CVs below 15% or 15% or lower from 2021 to 2023. We'll achieve that with these designs in all of the subsampled regulatory areas. We know that in 2020, because there were no sampling, there was no sampling in, in um, these three regulatory areas that the CVs um, were projected, I think this was a projection at the time, were projected to um, exceed, in effect, did exceed the, um, but this is a projection at the end of 2023. Even after collecting additional three years data, we're still projecting that these CVs will remain above 15%. Nevertheless, um, relative to other surveys, these are still um, precisely, relatively precisely estimated indices. So our proposed design proposal meets our primary objective of collecting high quality data for the stock assessment and for estimating stock distribution. Scientific Review Board um, had some comments. Um, they endorsed, they recommended that the Commission endorse the final 2021 FIST design as proposed by the Secretariat and provided it Appendix um, 4A of their report, which is the design you saw um, on slide 18. And they provisionally endorsed the 2022 and 2023 FIST design proposals, which were on slides 19 and 20, noting, recognizing that these will be reviewed again at subsequent SRB meetings. So these designs, while, while we're planning something three years out, so we can, um, um, so we can um, help one help the logistical side of things by having some idea of what's coming in, in years to come. Um, and to give um, stakeholders and, and commissioners an understanding of, of the process going forward, how we plan to, to revisit areas and on what time scale we plan to revisit those. As new data come in, we will revise there as an understanding of the distribution of Pacific halibut. And so there may be a need to revisit some of those design proposals and um, modify them in subsequent years. So it could be the new information that we have um, could indicate local contraction or expansion of distribution or changes in interannual variability. Some sub-areas may become more variable over time and may need to be sampled with greater frequency. And so this could lead to revisions in the future frequency of fifth sampling in each sub-area that will be incorporated into subsequent design proposals. Once we come up with a set of three years designs ahead, those are not set in stone. We're not um, immune to new information. Um, and um, so those, again, the 20, and so, Following the, the um, process for the 2021 design, the 2022 and 2023 designs may be revised um, following subsequent analysis of the early part of next year and um, input from the SRB.
And with noting that the secondary objective um, brings in the consideration of cost, um, those designs we propose for 2021 to 2023 already incorporate some consideration of cost. We propose logistically efficient sub-area designs in the lower density IPHE regulatory areas, 2A, 4A, and 4B. So we have already um, proposed something that we believe is realistic, um, and, and it would be undesirable for us to propose something that, that we know cannot be implemented. So we've come up with something that's both scientifically defensible and um, logistically feasible. And the FIS is funded by sales of captured fish and is intended to have long-term revenue neutrality, meaning that any design must also be evaluated in terms of the following factors, the expected catch of Pacific halibut, the expected Pacific halibut sale price, charter vessel costs, including relative costs per skate and per station, state costs, and IPHE secretary um, staff costs. And um, we have particularly Dr. Ian Stewart, um, with um, some help from um, Lara Erickson and myself, have developed a tool for um, evaluating designs on the basis of cost, um, which is um, helping us greatly in, in, um, in um, that part of the evaluation process. So balancing these factors may result in modifications to the design proposals. Um, we may need to increase sampling effort in high-density regions and decrease it in low-density regions in order to achieve those goals of, of revenue neutrality. And, um, and at present, with stocks near historic lows and low prices for fish sales, the current funding model may require that some low-density habitat be emitted from the design entirely, as occurred in 2020. So while we may come up with a scientific proposal that says we should be sampling this part of, of regulatory 2A or this part of regulatory 4B, for example, um, it may not be um, logistically or cost fe um, feasible from a cost or logistics perspective to do that in, um, as frequently or, or in, in its, with the exact timing that our scientific proposal is um, recommending. Um, but noting that if we do admit areas, as occurred in 2020, this will have implications for data quality, particularly if such reductions in effort relative to proposed designs continue over multiple years. We noted in the earlier slide, if we do get back on track and start um, fishing those scientifically-based designs, we can recover from that. We can get back within our scientific, um, scientifically developed um, um, data quality limits for in terms of precision and bias. So recommendations from this paper and presentation are that the commissioners note the paper that provides background and reviews um, the methods for IPHC fishery independent satellite survey rationalization following the expansion series and the proposed designs and proposes designs for 2021 to 2023. And I should note the evaluation methods are um, presented in much more detail in that accompanying paper um, and endorse the final 2021 scientifically based FIST design is proposed by the IPHC Secretariat and is recommended by the Scientific Review Board and provided at figure three, three of that report. And provisionally endorsed the 2022 and 2023 FISH design proposals provided at figures four and five respectively of report 07, recognizing that these will be reviewed again in 2021 and 2022 at SRB interim and annual meetings. And with that, I will questions. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Webster. I'll see if there's questions for you from commissioners. <laughs> Excuse me. Just um, before going to questions, can you bring your last slide back up? That is correct. Thank you, Commissioner DeGrieff. Um, in that case, so um, just to make sure I understand, at this meeting, you're seeking endorsement of 2021 fish design and a provisional one for 2022 and 2023, correct? OK, I see a number of people have questions. Um, in a particular order, I'll start with Peter.
Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Dr. Webster. Um, first of all, I just was curious how the space-time uh, model works when the distance to the closest station is so far. Like, it is, does the time, I mean, sort of, does the space, uh, is there anything significant you can take from um, the space-time model when, you know, the stations are so vast apart? Um, when, for example, we're fishing, we're estimating some um, regulatory of 4B in 2020, and we had no data in 2020 for 4B, so the closest information we had was in 3B. Um, that the data in 3B has no meaningful influence on on um, 4B. In fact, we don't even include 3B data in the modeling for 4B. We include some data from 4A. And again, we had no sampling in 4A. So the information there comes from past information in regulatory area 4B. So we did survey a large number of the stations in um, 2019. And so that will um, be the best, uh, will be the greatest influence on the estimates in 2020. And also previous years will have um, decreasing estimates as you go further back, influence as you go further back in time. So essentially what you would expect in the absence of any data in a regulatory area like 4B, which is distant from um, areas where we did collect data, is that you would get an estimate that's similar to the previous year's estimate. And at the station level, you would get station um, level estimates that are similar to what we got in 2019 and with some influence from previous years. Um, with further influence from whatever covariance we have in the model. So there is a, a depth um, relationship in the model in 4B. I don't think we have any, and, and a, yeah, we don't have anything else that, that would influence the model in estimates in 4B, for example, using that example. Um, but if if, if um, a station is typically, a, a deep water station has typically lower catch rates, then that will influence the estimate for that station in a year in which it's not surveyed. And so in, in summary, the, the, the information comes from proximity. It comes from stations that are nearby that have been fished, if those are available, and it comes from um, information from the last time we fished those stations and the times before that. So as time goes into the future and you don't um, return to these areas, that information becomes less and less relevant. You're not seeing change that might be occurring in between. The uncertainty will increase um, greatly as you in, as you go f further in, into time without revisiting those stations, and, you're, and the usefulness of that past information um, fades into into history. So that's why it's important that we should revisit um, um, stations on a, a, a reasonably frequent um, basis. Hopefully, that answers your question. Oh, that was very helpful. Um, just. just so I'm clear, though, uh, is there any input from um, the catch per unit effort or weight per unit effort uh, from the fishery on, like, does that have any input into the space-time model? Commissioner DeGrieff, no. Um, this is purely a fisheries independent model. We only use fisheries independent data sources. Um, I know, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I do have a couple other questions. Um, uh, one is uh, looking at slide 15, and I'm just curious. Um, so we're looking at a three-year plan. Um, you're looking at it every year. Uh, are you looking at the year three of uh, the plan going forward every year? Or are you um, sort of building a three-year um, uh, idea of what's going to happen and then another three-year idea of what's going to happen uh, three years down the road. Just, uh, I understand there's input into it um, every year, uh, just into the design, but is it a plan that's uh, revisited every year and the third year going out uh, is redesigned as well, or is it uh, one bulk proposal? Thank you. Yes, um, each year we will re revisit the years, the subsequent years. So in 2021, we will be revisiting the designs for 2022 and 2023 that we are proposing at this meeting. 
Um, and so we will look now with new data in hand from 2020, we will look at those designs to see if there's anything that we need to change. Should we move, um, for example, one component of, of a regulatory area up because um, in, um, in um, priority, bring it forward, or um, do we find that we don't need to sample this area that we thought we needed to sample based on this new information? Can we reduce our um, number of stations? For example, could be another consideration and still maintain the data quality in some regulatory areas. So once the new data comes in for a, for a given year, in this case, the 2020 data, that will then inform the analysis for um, 2021, which will inform any potential revisions in designs for 2022 and 2023, and the new design proposal, which will come next year for 2024. So we're not fixing a three-year set of designs and then um, not revisiting them until that set of um, years, that uh, block of years is complete and then coming up with the next three years. We have the potential to learn from um, new information and revise the designs for the subsequent two years. In this case, the ones we'll be looking at revising potentially be the designs for 2022 and 2023. Okay, and just so I'm clear, uh, in 2021, you would also be looking at potentially 2024 as a, uh, as, as a future one that you're going to be looking Here we will add one more year so that it is a three-year um, um, okay. um, proposal going forward. Okay, thank you. And then just uh, uh, in terms of the actual design, um, um, I know just for Area 2B that um, specifically some very highly productive stations are um, missed out actually two of the three years. Well, of course, so the question is, is it completely random or is there any, is it just completely random how those are developed uh, through, the, through the model? And Commissioner De Grief, yes, it was completely random. Um, we fixed a um, sampling rate that we we um, believe to be um, sufficient uh, to, well, more than sufficient to meet our data, data quality needs, but also provide us um, something that was logistically feasible in terms of number of stations. But it's random. But I'll, I'll note that in, in 2B and, and um, areas to the north of 3B, the stations that we don't fish in 2021 will be fished in 2022. So over a two-year period, all those gaps are, um, are filled in. Then in 2023, we'd start the randomization over again. We note that the sampling rate is over 50%. More than half the stations in 2B are expected to be fished in, um, are proposed to be fished in 2021. Those stations that are not fished in 2021 will be fished in 2022, plus some additional stations to meet that target sampling rate of more than 50%. So some of the stations will be fished in both years, which ones will again be um, uh, decided randomly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Alverson. Um, Dr. Webster, thanks for the presentation. Uh, last year at the annual meeting, we had sort of a crunch to come up with an alternate uh, design. And um, and during the early or late winter, I guess the late, uh, late winter, we had uh, Dr. Wilson uh, and your staff put together some uh, uh, cost estimates for the survey. Have, Will we do the same thing if we uh, endorse or recommend uh, the uh, 2021 uh, uh, design as you presented? Will there be additional review of, uh, say, in uh, uh, February, March, April, of looking at the, the cost uh, of those of the whole project, similar to what we did last year? Thank you, Commissioner Alverson. I'm going to defer to Dr. Wilson for um, most of this, but as I noted, we've developed a tool which is examining the cost of these things right now and whether the designs we propose on a scientific basis are in fact logistically feasible. But I imagine that I, I would expect any design um, modified 
or not by the commission at the annual meeting, um, we'll then um, have revised cost estimates put into such a tool and um, and um, we will examine its feasibility. But I'll um, hand that over to Dr. Wilson if he has it. anything additional to add. Yeah, thank you very much, Ray. Um, no, that, that's, uh, that, that's correct. Anything that was to be modified at the annual meeting would then be recalibra recalibrated through the simulation tool. Um, and we would then actually be proposing a new fishery independent set line survey budget accordingly. Um, and so what we are going to do, um, Lara Erickson and uh, Dr. Webster have also indicated that uh, the Secretariat has developed that simulation tool for looking at the cost benefit of any particular design. And uh, following discussions today on the 2021 design, we're going to present that to you tomorrow uh, so that you can actually take a look and see what the implications would be of some of those potential changes. So, uh, stay tuned for, for tomorrow's presentation on that. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, uh, Paul, uh, to David, would, would that include the, the cost estimates of, of the 2021 proposed uh, FISH that Ray Webster presented here? That, through the chair, yes, that's correct. And so we've already run that simulation uh, for the science-based proposal and a couple of other options that we're going to walk you through, uh, which includes the addition of, for example, the uh, Snapple trial uh, and the like. So yes, we'll see all of those tomorrow. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, Neil. Hi, Dr. Webster. I had a couple questions, and um, one of them was about this slide regarding the um, series of steps for review. And thank you for putting this together, first of all. I think it is really helpful to see how it all um, unfolds over the course of the year. Uh, my question or suggestion here was, in an earlier slide, you alluded to you know, where the opportunities for uh, input from skippers or the broader community of users would, that that would occur. Um, but in looking at the, the annual trajectory here, I wondered if, if it's possible, I think it would be helpful to have that reflected. Um, so for example, where does the RAB fit? Um, where does the um, uh, the review with skippers of implementation of the design and adjustments fit, um, and so on? Um, so, have you have you given any thought to where you see those sitting relative? Thank you, Commissioner Davis, that's a good suggestion. Um, I so. A lot of those are quite straightforward to put in here. I, it would, um, so the RAB occurs in February, generally. Um, and the skipper review, I'd have to consult my colleagues um, exactly um, how that process works. It might be quite a wide um, bar that, that covers multiple months um, where um, uh, vessel owners and other um, related stakeholders are consulted. Um, and certainly, I noted that the um, interim meeting and the an annual meeting are places where stakeholders certainly have their voices heard as well, and that can be made explicit in um, this chart. So I appreciate the suggestion. It's a good one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Look forward to that. Um, the other questions I had were, uh, there was a, a point at which you had described, I didn't write down the slide number, but um, in order to achieve uh, cost neutrality, uh, about the idea of increasing sampling in high density and decreasing in low density. And, and I, I wondered if we could talk a little more about that. So, you know, I, I think the, the concept of decreasing sampling in 
lower density sites in order to minimize losses in those areas. That kind of makes sense to me and I can see how that can be sort of rationalized within the context of the variance um, targets that we have, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea of increasing sampling in higher density areas was, I, th I thought, a little more, mm, I don't know if contentious is the right word, but I wondered about that one in that, you know, if we feel we have sufficient sampling in a particular region, the implications of um, adding stations strictly to um, uh, offset losses elsewhere or, or strictly with an eye towards that um, economic objective or um, cost neutrality objective for the, the survey and, and wondered about, I guess, both the optics of that, but also the, the implications for Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Um, I will say one thing, but maybe Dr. Wilson wants to contribute to this as well. And I'm, I'm sure this will be a discussion that um, will continue when um, the um, some of the um, results of the um, the tool that has been discussed are um, presented tomorrow. But um, from a scientific point of view, um, increasing those stations, increasing the station density in areas like 3A and, and, and 2C and 2B, um, the stations that, that make us money to fund the survey, is what may allow us to actually fish those other areas where we still have a need of data, but where the, the costs are um, on their own and in isolation are, are, um, would be um, um, too expensive to maintain revenue neutrality without increasing that station density. So if, while we may not need um, the data, and, and to um, ensure our, um, our data quality goals are met um, from those additional stations. If they allow us to get the data that we do need to maintain those um, goals in areas like 2A and 4A and 4B and 4CD, then I think that's certainly um, uh, scientifically um, defensible and scientifically um, preferable than um, not getting data in those areas when we need them. Okay, thank you. Um, it doesn't sound like Dr. Wilson had anything to add. So, um, maybe just one or two final points. Uh, one was, um, I wondered if uh, we could go to that final slide about um, what you're seeking from us today, um, <clears throat> particularly about endorsing the 2021 design um, today. Or, or in this meeting, um, and wondered if you could maybe tell us a little more about the sort of the driver for needing a decision at this meeting versus, for example, providing an opportunity for some question and review amongst everybody else in attendance that could lead to an endorsement at the annual meeting as an. Thank you. Again, I welcome the input from my colleagues. Um, from my perspective, the earlier we have some kind of endorsement, um, the, the better for um, for planning purposes for the future, although understanding that, that changes can be made um, at the annual meeting, as was done this year. Um, an endorsement doesn't, I, I don't think, means that you cannot make those changes. Um, I would expect changes to be made um, at the annual meeting. I, the endorsement to me um, represents an endorsement of, of what is a scientifically based design, that, 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 that you agree that this is, that this is a design that will be support, that this is a design that will um, provide from a scientific basis the information we need for the stock assessment and for the stock distribution, our primary scientific goals, recognizing that um, you certainly have the scope for um, modifying this design at the annual meeting following additional input and additional discussion and revision of um, 
uh, information on costs and logistics. Uh, um, I, I, I think an endorsement of this um, meeting would be helpful, but not restrictive in what comes forward. But um, welcome, um, Dr. Wilson, and anyone else to, to add to that. Yeah, thank you. Through through the chair, uh, just to echo both the, the previous intervention and also the one that uh, Dr. Webster has just made, um, it, the intention of having the commission endorse the uh, scientifically based uh, FIS design for 2021 at, at this meeting is so that we can finalize the uh, bid specifications and make the call for, for tenders. Uh, and that will occur in December. If we were to wait for that process uh, for the annual meeting, it means we wouldn't uh, launch that process, so those bid specifications, into uh, February, uh, which would put us under uh, quite enormous difficulty. Uh, so as Ray has pointed out, uh, we are asking for you to endorse the 2021 design, noting, as again, as Dr. Webster has pointed out, that you will have opportunity to suggest additional modifications and agree or not to those. Uh, at the annual meeting, um, and uh, even as we experience this year, you can continue to make those modifications up until uh, immediately prior to the season, uh, and that occurred up until May uh, of, of this year. So all of that's possible, so we're not locking you into uh, a particular design, we're locking you into a principled, scientifically based design, which will allow us to develop the bid specifications and call for tenders uh, prior to the end of 2020. Thank you, Chair. That's very helpful. All right, um, Richard, you had a question, I think. This time, I uh, through discussion, I had questions about the tool, but that will be explained tomorrow. So um, I'll I'll reserve my questions for that time. All right. Thanks very much, Richard. Maybe just to follow up on a couple of uh, questions. Um, for this current design that. Dr. Webster was just showing. Um, has RAB only had input from February 2020? So in February 2020, we were able to present um, the um, design proposals for the annual meeting, and I guess some subsequent discussion from that. And the, um, um, at the RAB, so they've only seen this design proposal in, in that it's a recycling of the proposal we made in, in um, 2020. So the time frame for RAB to have input is, is a little, um, perhaps it's not, um, it, it's, there's something of a lag, I suppose, with the RAB input. They're, they're essentially, their influence will be on the designs for 2021, uh, sorry, for 20. 2022 onwards. I'm not sure what um, influence they can have on the 2021 design, but um, their their input um, is um, will be is is um, able to be considered um, for any anything going forwards. But um, yeah, they have not seen this specific set of proposals um, except as having been previously proposed for 2020 to 2022. Okay, thanks um, very much. Maybe I could ask as well, have any of the charter operators had a chance to comment, comment or provide input on what has been presented? That's a Thank you. That's a question I'm going to have to turn over to my colleagues, particular, particularly um, Lara Erickson. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks. So, thank you, Dr. Webster, um, 
Yes, we do receive input from the set line survey skippers as well as the stakeholders and that's essentially on an ongoing basis. We receive that input um, during the set line survey se season as we work closely obviously with all the various owners and skippers. We receive it at the end of the season when we do our um, what we call our debriefs or our reviews with both our secretariat that are on the vessel as well as the skippers and crew. Um, and then we receive it when we post our tender specifications as part of the review of those and leading up to potential submissions. And then once the submission's in, we work very closely with the skippers and owners on um, establishing what we call cruise plans and working out um, the best way to approach and implement the design and um, and how to fish the particular stations that will be fished. Uh, so yes, it's um, pretty much an ongoing and continual um, collaboration and exchange of input and, um, and logistical concerns and best ways to implement the design, the science design that's presented and obviously adopted. Sorry, Chair, we seem to have lost audio. If you could uh, try again. Okay, well, just while we uh, uh, take a break for a minute or two, uh, the chair is going to reconnect uh, his connection with the meeting. So I would, uh, unless uh, Commissioner Oliver would like to take over while that occurs, we can pause for two minutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dave, I, wow, sorry, there's a bad echo. Huh. Let's wait on Paul. Let's, something, now I've got problems. Okay, just pause the meeting for a couple of minutes and try and reestablish a connection uh, with the chair. So please hold tight, everybody, uh, and give us uh, two, three minutes. Thank you. Hey, Dave, there's Paul here. Can hear you again, Chair. Uh, back to you. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. The power just went out here. We, there was quite a windstorm that went through um, the area the other day, and uh, but now the power came back on. So it took a few minutes to to um, start up again. Sorry for that interruption. I hope there's no more um, power outages. But there's been a lot on Vancouver Island um, over the last few days. Lots of people are out of power. Um, I'm sorry, Larry, I, I missed, uh, I think, all of your answer to my question. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you, yes, Chair. I can. essentially summarize that um, it, the communication and coordination with the stakeholders and particularly with the set line survey skippers and owners is a year round um, occurrence in that during when the um, set line survey is initiated at the start of the season, 
we're obviously throughout the season in close communication with them as we uh, work through the um, as we conduct the work that's required of the setline survey. Um, it's also at the end of the season when we conduct what we call or refer to as our debriefs with our secretariat that have been on the vessel, as well as with the skipper and crew. And then um, it is also it takes place once we put the tender specifications on our website, because as soon as those are live, then we start discussions again with the various vessels and stakeholders and potential owners and operators that may submit um, that may submit uh, bids for the in response to the tender the request for tender and um, so they'll be in contact with all of us with the secretariat to discuss um, their concerns or, or what their considerations are. And then obviously it definitely takes place following the submission when um, we do the actual award of the um, set line survey work for the given season as we work together on cruise plans and best ways to implement the design that's been adopted, approved and adopted to meet the scientific needs. Okay, thanks very much, Lara, for um, that information. Um, one other question I have, I think it's for yourself, Dr. Wilson. Um, if uh, under the current proposal to endorse the design for 2021 at this meeting, what I heard you communicate was that going forward, you would complete the charter uh, proposals and send those out for um, charge for people to provide their bids and, and selection and that would be completed the selection would be completed by the end of January next year um, is, so did I hear you correctly that's first the, I guess the first question then I uh, yes chair up. that is that is correct and and maybe I can uh, help uh, with with the, the follow-up in the sense that the intention is uh, over the next uh, month we will develop the uh, bid specifications um, and there are certain caveats that are tied into those bid specifications and we did this last year as well where we, we put forward uh, the, the design that we feel we're going to go ahead with it's the most likely design within the bid specifications the bids are made based on those specifications noting the various caveats we put in place that for example uh, between the uh, call for tender and the final bids uh, sorry the final uh, tenders being signed off on there may be additional changes uh, and that's a sort of a standard practice that we go through every year um, so back to you thank you chair um, yes okay thank you um, if there were changes made by the commission at the annual meeting how would that then be taken into account by the people that are bidding thank you chair and commission were to uh, change one regulatory area or remove a uh, charter region for example or increase the density uh, we would then go back to the uh, successful bidders and uh, see if those terms are, are acceptable or not. Uh, if they were not, then we'd have to reconsider uh, going back out for another call for, for tenders. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I think given what transpired this year, as far as making decisions on the design that we certainly don't want to re replicate that process. But I, I guess the question I, I still have in my mind, Dr. Wilson, is, is it better to have a final decision made in January and then finalize the charter tenders by the end of February and delay a month? Um, which I think maybe is the question that Neil was kind of getting at or implying in his question earlier. Through the chair, so very quickly, and I'll pass to Ms. Erickson to, to add. Sorry. So my question. Um, and I'll pass to Ms. Erickson to see if there's a follow-up. 
uh, and most of the operators or all of the operators have uh, need, a need to put in place various business plans for 2021. And so the primary reason for getting this on the calendar um, and uh, set in place as soon as possible with various caveats is to ensure both our operational plan uh, and ability to purchase bait pre-season, uh, and then also for the various charter operators who are selected to include those charter operations within their 2021 business operation plan. Uh, and so it is better in, in, in our opinion to have the uh, bid process, <clears throat> excuse me, the big bid process um, finalized by the end of January uh, at the latest with the various caveats that are put in place as, as part of the bid specs. And that seems to have worked for uh, the interested um, bidding companies and, and charter operators for, for many years. Uh, and so I'll pass to Ms. Erickson to see if she'd like to, to add anything through the chair. So please, uh, Ms. Erickson. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dr. Wilson. I was <clears throat> essentially going to echo Dr. Wilson's words in that our intent with getting the tender specifications out early and awarding the charter regions or the work to particular vessels is that then those operators and owners are coordinating their other activities around the work that they do for the commission rather than trying to find a way to fit in potential work with us um, down the road. All right, um, thank you very much for that additional explanation. I don't see any other commissioners have questions. At sorry, this point. sorry, Paul. I'll just confirm. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. I just actually want to um, have you had communications with the charter owners, uh, charter vessels on this particular uh, subject about uh, best timing? I just I would be very curious on their feedback because I know um, they would probably rather have everything set in place and understand where they stand, um, where there was limited time of changes as well. Like um, that, would, that, that would be a factor to them. So I'm, I'm curious, have you already discussed with the charter operators um, when the best time for, for this is for, for their business planning? Okay. Through the chair, thank you, thank you, Commissioner DeGree. Um, you're exactly correct in that uh, for the vessel operators and owners, the ideal situation is for them to have the RFT released as soon as possible following um, the adoption of the design, because that allows them to then um, design their business plan for the following season. So they in our eyes, getting the or releasing the RFT as well as the tender specifications in December is as late as we would like to do it. And then having the cutoff at the end of January is actually as late as we would ideally like to do it, given the discussions we've had with the stakeholders. And obviously, the sooner the better, because then that allows them to plan all of their other various activities and and solidify their business plans for the following year. Okay, so that is the feedback you heard. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks very much. Um, so it sounds like we will potentially coming back to this and provide an endorsement. So maybe rather than doing that right now. Dr. Wilson will come back to it. Um, yes, through the chair. That's, that's um, sorry. Um, sorry, yes, it's through the chair. That's probably the most um, log logical path forward once we present the cost benefit to the various um, designs to you tomorrow. Thank you, Chair. Okay. What uh, agenda item is that? Uh, through the chair, we would just revisit this agenda item as time permits, uh, and if not, uh, during other business. Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay. 
All right, um, so let's do that. Um, then I think uh, we should move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is 6.4. And is that Dr. Stewart that's gonna cover that? And so we'll pass to Dr. Stewart. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Uh, I'm gonna be work talking this afternoon, giving two presentations, uh, probably only a portion of this one before lunch. I I'll note that I have uh, several logical breakpoints in this presentation that I could um, potentially stop at depending on when you wanna take the lunch break. I see that we're uh, down to just 10 minutes left in the official session. So I will just continue through the presentation until um, directed otherwise. Um, Dr. Stewart, just before you um, start, uh, Dr. Wilson, do we have public comment and questions? We will have some public comment and questions, Chair, uh, but uh, we currently have one hour scheduled for a lunch break. Given we are a little bit behind, it may be worthwhile pushing through as much as possible and then coming up at the size limit review, uh, having in those questions as well. Thank you, Chair. So um, you're proposing, Dave, that we go through 6.4 then take public comment? Um, I, Chair, I, I think uh, at least taking us up to one o'clock or something when there's a logical time for a break in Dr. Stewart's presentation. Um, and then I think there's also going to be quite a number of comments on the size limit review. So, so maybe still take it after 6.5. Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay, so do that after 6.5. All right, so Dr. Stewart, if you could go through your presentation, uh, we'll run a little bit longer. Uh, to approximately one o'clock and then we'll break for lunch and then we'll start up again. Uh, I guess it, well, we'll confirm that when we get to one o'clock. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Stewart. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will uh, I'll, I'll point out several places where we can pause in this presentation as is convenient. Uh, I'd like to start today by acknowledging the work that was done by the IPHC Secretariat staff. As you've seen, our data sets are nearly complete this year, despite all the challenges that occurred during 2020. Uh, we had staff in all of the ports that were uh, that we normally staff, at least those that were accepting landings this year. Uh, so on the commercial side, we have uh, nearly identical data set to what we would have in any normal year. And on the survey side, as you've noted, although we did curtail some of the distribution of the survey, we end up in aggregate at the coastwide level with one of the most precise surveys we've, we've ever had. And so what this means is that uh, all of the products that I can show you today, including all of the assessment results, the management quantities and other things are all um, basically calculated in, in a standard manner. So we, we don't have any, uh, any particular challenges this year in the output of the products that we need to, to move through the process. That said, uh, we did have some areas that we did not sample in the, in the fifth survey, and I will point out uh, some sources of information that we can potentially draw on to help us better understand what may or may not be going on um, in some of those IPHC regulatory areas that were not directly sampled by the fifth this year. So the quick summary of this presentation is that as we have for the last two years, we're still tracking the 2011 and 12 cohorts into the stock. We've now seen them three times in the, in the fifth survey and one time in the fishery. Um, although the year classes remain uncertain, they are going to be increasingly important to both the survey and the fishery and then the stock are moving farther into the future. Because we are moving past a period of relatively low recruitment in 2006 to 2010, uh, we have further stock declines projected over the next several years. Due to um, the change in the reference level of fishing intensity that was noted earlier as one of the intersectional deci decisions made during 2020 from an F46 to an F43 reference level, uh, this has buffered the change somewhat in overall uh, mortality levels projected for 2021 at the reference level. And I'll speak more to that later in this presentation. 
And finally, uh, due to the sampling that did occur in biological regions two and three, which represents some of the most precise surveys we've ever had in those two regions, uh, we did see quite a strong change in the stock distribution with a market increase in biological region three and a decrease in region two. And these, these changes will have effects uh, not only on the, the stock distribution, but on the um, implementation of the current manage, interim management procedure, which I'll describe at the end of this presentation. So I'm going to speak to four different sections of this analysis. The first is a summary of the data sources prior to any stock assessment modeling. Then I'll speak to the results of this year's stock assessment, provide the projections and decision tables we have in past years, and then finally uh, some of the more detailed breakdowns as we start to apply the interim management procedure and look at the uh, potential mortality limit levels for 2021 on a finer scale. So you've already heard a presentation with a considerable amount of detail in uh, the mortality that was exerted on the stock in 2020. And I want to provide a little bit of that information again, and perhaps a little bit of historical perspective. You can see from this graph that we've had many ups and downs in the total mortality on the stock from a low in the late 1970s. Um, and we are now currently in 2020, just about a million and a half pounds above that, that minimum value that we saw in the late 1970s. As you heard in the earlier presentation, the reductions that we saw in 2020 across um, nearly all sectors have resulted in one of the lowest levels of mortality in recent years, both due to the lower adopted catch limits for 2020, as well as the um, fact that several sectors came in substantially below either their limits or the, the projections as we made them at, at the beginning of last year. So to provide you a little bit more detail, this first table shows you the projections that we made at last year's annual meeting, AM096. And you can see that at that time, based on the catch limits that were adopted, we were projecting a total mortality to the stock in 2020 of just over 38 million pounds. Noting that uh, based on the commission's directive, uh, we were using the three-year average for non-directed discards as our projection for the upcoming year in order to try and buffer some of the annual ups and downs that we had seen over previous years. If we look to the current estimates, and I'll note that there may already be some discrepancies between some of the material you see in, in some of the documents and these results, because uh, these are the estimates that were produced at the end of October in time for the stock assessment analysis. So you can see um, in this bottom figure chart that uh, nearly all of the sectors came in below where we had projected to the tune of an aggregate of, uh, aggregate of almost 3 million pounds below um, our overall projections. And that was the commercial landings and commercial discards. And I'll note that commercial landings and, and discards also include all uh, FIS and research mortality. And that uh, the recreational component on, the, on this slide also includes all of the uh, estimates of discard mortality. So this is a total mortality estimate and it's projected through the end of the calendar year. So to our best understanding, we're pretty likely to come in well under where we projected from last year. Note, of particular note is that uh, second to last column of non-directed discards at just over five million pounds. This represents uh, by far the lowest value that we've seen in the entire historical time series since back to the early 1960s. Uh, previously, we had seen a value of around six million pounds. So with that reduction in mortality, as you'll see later in this presentation, uh, that perhaps this is one of the silver linings of 2020 is that not only with the lower catch limits, but the lower um, sector level um, mortality, we, we're actually seeing a reduction in fishing intensity even more than we expected for 2020. I will note that when we get to the forward projections, uh, based on the commission directive to use the three-year average for non-directed discards, we will be projecting forward a slightly higher amount into 2021, which would be that 5.9 million pounds. And um, that's probably a, still a good projection as uh, many of these fisheries are, are quite variable. And it's not clear that some of the reductions in uh, 2020 may continue into 2021. So I'm going to describe uh, many of the data sources at several different levels. Uh, the first level would be the level of biological regions, which is our best interpretation of the, the components that matter most to the stock dynamics. Then, of course, I'll be presenting much of the data also broken down to individual IPHC regulatory area, which corresponds to people's fishing practices in those areas, 
uh, individual um, set line survey activity in each of the regulatory areas and has a much closer tie to then the implementation of our interim management procedure. So the first component, you've already seen a, a brief uh, preview of this from Dr. Webster. Um, the, the most important component from the FIST survey is the trend in numbers per unit effort because this is used as the primary index of abundance in the stock assessment. Um, you can see in this figure, uh, and uh, this is by um, biological region, and the percent in each of the panels represents the percent change from 2019 to 2020. But in the bottom center, you can see at the coastwide level, the survey numbers per unit effort were down just 1%, noting that that estimate is also very precise at the coastwide level, reflecting those highly precise surveys in regions two and three um, and with nearly 100% sampling in uh, several of those regulatory areas. Note that regulatory or biological region two showed the largest decrease at minus 8%. And that's again, we'll see that again in the individual IPHC regulatory areas, but that will be important in terms of stock distribution. I'll highlight here, and I think Dr. Webster spoke to this as well, that we didn't have direct sampling in region four or region 4B in 2020. And therefore, we have much wider confidence intervals in 2020. Um, however, these are small enough components of the overall stock that we still end up with a very precise survey at the coastwide level. So although there might be some additional uncertainty um, due to uh, missing these, these two regions and, of course, the IPHC regulatory areas within them, um, that is most likely to translate into some of the management-related quantities and not so much into the stock assessment itself. And I will speak um, specifically to places that we can look for additional information to help us understand what trends might be occurring in these areas where we, we didn't sample directly with the FIS survey. We do still have data from those areas from the commercial fishery. So the second component is the all sizes weight per unit effort. So this is weight per unit effort, but not just for legal size fish, but for sublegals as well. And here we see a very similar pattern to the previous slide with some slightly more positive trends. And I'll call your attention to the coastwide level, which was up 2% compared to down 1% for numbers per unit effort. And the difference in those two trends gives us an indication that the productivity in the stock during 2020 came more from growth of individual fish than it did from in recruitment or numbers of fish coming into the stock. And that's quite consistent with our understanding that we have a 2005 and then a 2011 and 12 year class that are moving their way through and really not a lot of fish around those year classes at this point. Moving then into the weight per unit effort, uh, this now is the O32 or legal size weight per unit effort. And I'm showing this at the level of individual IPHC regulatory areas because this is gonna provide an index that is most comparable to the commercial fishery uh, weight per unit effort as reported in log books, which I'll show in just a second. And I'll call your attention to a couple things in this figure. Uh, the, the first is the um, trends that we saw at first in IPHC regulatory area 2B in the top center, what had the strongest decline from 2019 to 2020 of 10 percent. Second, in IPHC regulatory area 3A in the center left was up 24 percent from 2019. And this is following a pretty big decrease from 2018 to 2019. So in aggregate, <laughs> The, the, uh, the 3A trend over almost the last decade has been relatively flat after this increase in uh, 2020. Finally, um, at the coastwide level, you see that the legal size weight per unit effort was up 6%. And that difference, again, above the total weight per unit effort indicates that much of this growth productivity is occurring in O32 size fish. And again, this is consistent with the first advent or the first entry of these uh, 2011 and 12 year classes into the legal size biomass in the stock. And we, we'll see that when we get to the fishery data here in just a second. So the last component that we draw from the FIST survey, uh, the model FIST survey results, is the biological stock distribution. And as we've seen in previous years, uh, over the longer time horizon, over several decades, we've seen an increase in the stock distribution in region two to somewhat higher levels than we saw in the 1990s and 2000s, and a concurrent decrease in Region 3 from 60 to 70 percent in the early part of the survey time series uh, down to more like 50 percent in recent years. And you can also see that 
that fairly sharp jump at the end of the time series in Region 3. Finally, we can also see that in Region 4, the stock distribution appears to have been increasing over this whole time period, from just a little over 10% to now over 20% uh, in recent years. So a, a continued increasing trend. And even within Region 4, we, as Dr. Webster noted, we've actually seen some evidence that there's some movement to the north within the region as well. And so that's something that we're tracking closely. And one of the reasons why the science proposal that Dr. Webster showed earlier um, encourages full sampling in IPHC regulatory area for CD and E because of this apparent shift um, and the uncertainty that's associated with a potentially changing distribution in that IPHC regulatory area. If I zoom in on just the end of those uh, figures and just show you the actual percentages, you can see um, again quite clearly the jump downward by about 2% in Region 2 and up by about the same amount in Region 3 with little change in 4 and 4B, noting that those are essentially just um, you drawing through the space-time model, drawing from the temporal correlation, which is unlikely to produce much change in the absence of new data. I'll move now into the fishery trends. This is a figure of the coastwide logbook records um, aggregated all the way up to the coastwide level, and then I'll provide a further breakdown here in a second. So commercial weight per unit effort is reported via log, the logbook program. We collect this across the entire stock um, in all the ports that we staff, as well as ports that we don't staff, um, where these logs are, are sent to us or we, we recover them in other ways. Um, at the time that we close the data sets at the end of October, uh, we know that there are still logs outstanding. Some people are still fishing. Some logs are there, but we have yet to collect them. And some logs we won't get until they come in the mail over the winter. Uh, unfortunately, what this means is that um, this data set is perhaps more incomplete than some of the others. And what we've found over the last eight years in looking at this trend is that we almost always see a revision downward after the season is over. The logs that we get late in the year tend to be lower catch rates than the ones we get earlier in the year. And so if we correct for that, we would expect that there'd be essentially no change uh, from 2019 to 2020 after we've accounted for the logs that, that we don't yet have. So this is something that's been a very consistent pattern over a number of years, um, and it's something that, that we account for. We also account for that in the stock assessment by having a larger variance estimate on the terminal point, on the 2020 point, um, until those logs are finalized. And then moving into next year's stock assessment, um, we will have a greater precision on that point as well in the stock assessment. So if we then move into individual IPHC regulatory areas, and here I've, I've broken out the data into several different components. We started doing this a few years ago, and I think it's been very helpful to understand where some of these broader trends are coming from. Uh, in regulatory area 2A on the left, we, we break the time, the uh, series into both tribal and non-tribal fisheries. These fisheries operate in different geographic zones and at different times. We saw a, quite a strong increase in both of those fisheries in catch rates in 2020. Um, and we're also noting that both of those fisheries took place uh, somewhat differently than they have in previous years, either at different times or longer fisheries or both. In uh, regulatory areas 2B and 2C, you can see we've divided the data out by fixed hook and snap gear. Most of the fishing that occurs in 2B occurs with snap gear, and so there's much more precise estimates there. And that gear showed a 14% decrease from 2019 to 2020, following both gear types, following a trend over the last several years toward decreasing catch per unit effort. In regulatory area 2C, the signal was somewhat more mixed, uh, with each gear being up or down approximately 2%. Moving now to the center of the stock in Region 3, uh, you can see that these two series show some differences between the two gear types. And this is, as we've looked at this over the last several years, what we've come to, to realize is that we often see as much difference in a year-to-year -year change with, between the two gear types within the commercial fishery as we do between the commercial fishery and the fifth survey. So I think it's worth noting that all of these are capturing a somewhat different snapshot of what's going on. The, the fishery is occurring over a longer period of time, but we know from looking at the records that the different gear types tend to exploit different portions of the IPHC regulatory areas. Certainly they represent different vessels. Uh, and so each of these is giving us perhaps a little bit different perspective on the uh, catch rates that, that occurred over that time period and on the trend from last year to this year. So in IPHC uh, regulatory area 3A, 
fixed hook was nearly flat and snap was up. And in 3B, both the fixed hook and the snap were up um, fairly solidly from 2019 to 2020. Now, as we move to region four, and this includes both four and 4B, I've got them all just all on the same slide here. Um, this is an area where we did not have direct fist sampling. And so this is where we might look to see, well, where, where, where is there a difference between what the uh, space-time model is projecting in the absence of any data and what was actually seen by the fisheries uh, from 2019 to 2020? On the left, IPHC regulatory area 4A, the signals were somewhat mixed, uh, up with one gear and down with the other. On the right, both of those gear types, um, snap and fixed hook in 4C and fixed hook in 4D, uh, both, both of those series show a slight increase from 2019 to 2020. However, in the center panel for IPHC regulatory area 4B, you can see that we saw a fairly sharp negative trend in both of those. And that's somewhat in contrast to what the space-time model was projecting of an increase in weight per unit effort in 4B. And so I think this is one point where we might want to just note that um, the trends did differ somewhat in 4B. And because this is our only source of direct information from, um, from the fishery in 2020, it might be of note as we move farther through the process. Finally, now moving past the, just the catch rates into the, the fish that were landed. So this figure shows you the time series from the early 1990s of the average weight of a Pacific halibut that hit the dock in each of these IPHC regulatory areas with all of 4 and 4B aggregated here at this point um, so that we can uh, extend the time series a little bit farther back. Noting that these fish, the, the coastwide average in black down the middle there suggests that these fish were on average around 30 pounds or slightly more uh, back in the 1990s, and now have dropped down to the, to the low 20s. However, you can also see, and I've highlighted it here, uh, that over the last decade, we've seen um, very little change in the average size fish. So although I know we've all gotten in the habit of saying, well, you know, fish are, fish are getting smaller, well, actually they're not getting smaller anymore. The fish haven't gotten smaller since about 2009 or 2010. Since that time period, we've actually seen uh, quite a stable average size fish in the commercial fishery across all regulatory areas. Moving then into the age information from the commercial fishery, and uh, there's a lot of data on this single figure here. On the y-axis is the age of fish in years. On the x-axis is the individual years that they came from. And each circle represents the percent of the catch in that year that occurred at that age by number. And so you can, a strong diagonal pattern in the circles is indicative of a, of a very strong year class moving to the right and up each year, one, one over and one up. And uh, the size of the circle, of course, represents the, the contribution to the catch. And so the bigger circles represent the ages that are most important to the commercial fishery. And you can see across this whole time series, approximately ages eight or nine through ages 16 to 18 have been the most important for the commercial fishery. And in fact, that pattern extends all the way back um, for 100 years. We see very similar age structure in the stock, or in the, in the removals from the stock, all the way back uh, to the early part of last century. The, um, the, most of these circles are black because we don't have sex-specific information except in, from 2017 to 19, where you see two colors there, the females in red and the males in blue. Quite clearly, the female circles are much larger, indicating that the female contribution to the commercial fishery is much higher than males. At the end of this time series, you can see the introduction or the arrival of the 2011 and 12 year classes. So those large circles at ages eight and nine are essentially the first time we've had a good look at these two year classes within the directed commercial fishery specifically. And this is quite good to see because we've been tracking these two cohorts for two years in the setline survey, waiting for them to become large enough to, to graduate into the landed catch. And now right on schedule, here they come um, into the catch in uh, 2020. Comparing to the age information from the FIS survey, uh, you see quite a similar pattern. Um, here, of course, we have sex specific information for the entire time series, perhaps a slightly stronger um, picture of some of the, the uh, larger year classes like 1987 and 2005. You might be able to see a little bit better in these diagonals. Uh, and then in uh, 2020, we see for the third time now the 2011 and 12 um, year classes. 
which again corroborates nicely with what we saw in the commercial fishery. Of course, these FIS ages include all sizes of fish, sublegal and legal, and that's why we were able to pick up those year classes coming in a couple of years earlier uh, than we did in the commercial fishery. Now, as I mentioned, we have several IPHC regulatory areas uh, that were not directly sampled by the FIS in 2020. And so this raises the question, as we move forward, this 2011 and 12 year class are going to be increasingly important to the, to the fishery. And um, it raises the question of, well, what might we infer about the distribution of these two year classes in areas that we did not sample directly in 2020? Now, we have some information to help guide us with that. We can look to previous cohorts and how their distribution has changed over time to give us maybe a better understanding of these incoming year classes and how they may be distributed next year in 2021. So, as was noted in the earlier presentation, uh, there are now uh, interactive tools available on the IPHC's website. The, the hyperlink at the bottom of this slide will take you to one of those, um, or actually take you to a links to several of them. One of these tools I use uh, quite frequently to try to understand the distribution of incoming cohorts, which is this interactive tool that maps out the, the FIS survey catch rates by individual cohorts at different ages. And so what I'm showing you here is a map on top of the 2005 cohort, which we know has been quite strong. It's been very important to the fishery for almost a decade now, well, maybe six or eight years now, uh, very important to the fishery, present in the stock for, for a decade. Um, and then on the bottom is the distribution of that same cohort at age nine. And you see quite a difference there. And, and this is something that's quite characteristic of your classes as they move into the stock. We tend to see them on the east and west sides of the stock, often with a gap in the central gulf. And then as they get older, generally sometime around age nine, we tend to see them filling in strongly across the, the center of the stock, as we do in that bottom panel there for the 2005 cohort at age nine. If we look forward now to the 2011 and 12 cohorts, at age six, we saw see a similar pattern. And, and noting that we had a survey that extended all the way across the range in, in, in uh, when these cohorts were six years old. This is actually two different surveys from several years ago. But we see that characteristic gap in the center of the Gulf of Alaska. And perhaps a little bit more sparse distribution at the southern end of the stock. Looking forward then at age eight, and this would be the 2020 survey for the 2012 cohort and the 2019 survey for 2011, you can see that these cohorts are, are now starting to fill into that gap, just as we've seen previous cohorts do. Now we don't have data at age nine for these two cohorts, but we do have it for 2011. Noting that we had the truncated survey, you can see in this bottom panel now that basically everywhere that we surveyed in 2020, we saw the 2011 cohort. And the ends of that distribution, just, just north of uh, Vancouver Island and all the way out, a uh, little, little past Chignik, almost to the Aleutians, that's the edge of our survey design. So we couldn't have seen these year classes any farther than that. So I think the takeaway from this is that these two year classes, 2011 and 12, are likely old enough now to be distributed across the entire stock. And so even though we didn't have direct sampling, in um, the far west and in the far south, I think it's reasonable to expect based on the distribution of other cohorts uh, that they are likely to be fairly distributed across those areas moving into 21, 2021. And so we probably don't have any additional concern about uh, relying on these cohorts moving forward, uh, even though we didn't get to see them this year in 2020. Now, of course, we will certainly be looking forward to a direct observation in uh, several of these areas in the 2021 FIS survey. And I would encourage you, if, you, if you're interested in, in digging deeper, you can track any cohort that we've seen yet in the setline survey um, using this tool and watch its distribution. Okay, the last piece of biological information I'd like to present is with regard to length at age. And so I, what I've chosen here is to show you the length at age for female Pacific halibut from IPHC regulatory area 3A. These are some of the most important fish in the stock. We know that females comprise the majority of the commercial catch, and 3A is the single largest regulatory area. So I've tried to select the place that's perhaps most important to the stock dynamics. Now this figure shows you average fork length on the y-axis as measured by our survey crews on the water and the year on the x-axis. Each series shows you an individual age. And so if you take a color and track it across this, this graph, 
it gives you an idea of how has the size of age for that particular age changed over this time period. And you can see if you start at the top at age 18, the orange circles, and the circle size is proportional to the sample size. So the bigger the circle, the more samples we had. You can see for age 18, we've seen a fairly strong decline in size at age from over 130 centimeters down to somewhere in the 100 to 110 range uh, in recent years. So that's a pretty big decrease in the size of fish. However, if you look at some of the younger ages, and particularly at the end of the time series, you can see what appears to be a four to six, maybe even seven year increasing trend at the end of that time series. And I, if I just highlight it here with some trends at the end of that time series, you can see that for ages seven through about 12 or 13, um, we're starting to see some improvement in size at age. In fact, for ages 12 and under, the size at age is at or above any size at age that we've observed since the late 1990s. And so it's still early to say whether there's actually a meaningful change across the entire stock in length at age, but certainly IPHC regulatory area 3A is one of the areas that's, that's shown the biggest declines over history. Uh, so I think that there's definitely potential for some increasing trend in size at age here. And I really look forward to some of the results from our research program, which is studying um, the factors influencing size at age to help us better understand this. Now, I will temper expectations a little bit by pointing out that trends in size at age take decades to unfold. So even though this looks promising at present, uh, we shouldn't expect large changes in yield in the short term. Uh, this is something that's gonna take a, a very long time to see just what the trends are. And if they are increasing, it will take years before we really start to see the benefits of increased yield per fish um, in the overall stock calculations. So we had two new sources of information that were available for 2020, and they're both sex-specific age composition information following on the heels of the data that was available for the 2019 stock assessment, which was the first time ever we'd had direct sex ratio information for the directed commercial fishery. The first of these two sources of information uh, comes from Alaska Department of Fish and Game, thanks to Sarah Webster for um, compiling these for me. Um, we've always had age composition data from the recreational fishery in Alaska, but now for the first time we have sex-specific age composition. And a similar plot to, that you've seen for the fishery and the fish survey, here you can see for this entire time series that the recreational fishery is accessing fish that are considerably younger than we see in the commercial fishery. So these fish, instead of 8 to 16 or 18, these fish are 5 to maybe 11 or 12 years old on average. We do, however, see a similar pattern of strong year classes. And in fact, at the end of that time series, we can also see quite strongly the 2011 and 12 year class, uh, particularly strong for the 2012 year class, which was um, age seven. And these data only go through 2019 at present, but we will, of course, be extending this time series moving forward. Uh, in aggregate, the, the recreational fishery in Alaska catches approximately 72% female halibut. So I know there were lots of questions last year when we first had direct information for the, for the directed commercial fishery about how some of these other mortality, uh, sector mortalities might differ. And in fact, 72% is even a little higher than we expected for the recreational fishery. However, this has very little effect on the stock assessment because these, uh, this mortality in aggregate is much, much smaller than that for the directed commercial fishery. And so the effect is, uh, is very small relative to the kinds of effects that we saw last year when we first introduced direct sex ratio information to uh, the stock assessment model for the directed commercial fishery. Now we were able to extend that time series uh, thanks again to our research program and thousands of genetic samples analyzed um, to, to provide us with another year of data. Uh, now we have 2019 added to this series and while we continue to see very similar patterns across the regions, with particularly region four being the highest percent female and region 4B being the lowest, uh, we're now starting to see some temporal trends as well, with a decrease in the sex ratio from 82% coastwide down to 78% in 2019. Now this is consistent with having several cohorts in the stock that are growing older. So as a cohort gets older, we expect to be extracting more males from that cohort. And so with 2005 and now 11 and 12, um, I think it's not surprising that we're seeing a slight decrease in the overall aggregate uh, sex ratio. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we're now extending this very valuable time series. Um, and the more data that we add to this time series, uh, the better we will be able to estimate things like natural mortality 
and um, this will, over the long term, help us to uh, reduce the overall uncertainty in the stock assessment models. So I'll finish the data section by discussing just very briefly some of the ecosystem conditions in 2020 that are relevant to the Pacific halibut stock. We have known for some time that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a, a gross metric of overall productivity of the Gulf of Alaska, um, is correlated with a Pacific halibut recruitment. It, we, we don't have a specific mechanism for this correlation, uh, but because it's linked to overall productivity and, and temperature and sea level height, um, we, we have noted that there are many potential avenues for a feedback uh, from these types of conditions to Pacific halibut recruitment. And we do see over the 100 year time series, we do see a correlation where when the, the Pacific decadal oscillation is positive, which is the time periods here where you see green dots and, and a green line across the top showing you the average condition over each of those periods. During those periods, on average, we have higher uh, recruitment to the Pacific halibut stock. Conversely, when the PDO is low, we tend to have lower average recruitment. However, it's not a good predictor of individual year classes. So noting that we've just come from a period from 2006 to 2013 with relatively low PDO values, uh, and we did definitely have uh, low recruitment from 2006 to 10, we also seem to have had better recruitment in 2011 and 12, which still fell in that time period. So it's unclear whether uh, recent conditions of the PDO are still highly um, correlated with incoming recruitment to the stock or not, uh, but nonetheless, it is one of the few looks that we have at the potential for recruitment moving forward into the future. And so we've, we have, from 2014 onward, been in a period of positive PDO, uh, with 2020 being the first year, at least through October, where the PDO has now dipped back into a negative average for the year. Again, we don't know if these correlations uh, are going to hold up in the future, but certainly over the historical record, um, they have been helpful to explain the average level of, of productivity in the stock. Finally, um, there are two other ecosystem conditions I'd like to highlight. And I, before I do, I, I'd like to point out that um, the IPHC draws heavily on the work by uh, NOAA scientists, uh, mainly provided through the North Pacific Fishery Management Council uh, process, in order to get access to a, a huge amount of analysis on the environments, both in the Bering Sea and in the Gulf of Alaska. So I would encourage you to, to, to look at um, available information from that source for more detail. The two points that I'd like to highlight um, from the preliminary reports that I've seen are, um, first with regard to the Bering Sea, we had had two winters in a row with almost no ice in the Bering Sea. And ice in the Bering Sea is an extremely important structuring component it separates species distributions. It keeps fish in the southern part of the Bering Sea that can't move north because of the temperature. Uh, and it seems to have strong implications for not just halibut distribution, but several important prey and potential competitive species. In 2019 and 20, we had a much more normal year. There was ice cover for a good chunk of the year. However, it did have an early breakup, and I believe we've also seen some much warmer water conditions over the summer than we do normally. So even though the, the winter was more normal, um, it's not clear that uh, all of the, the longer term effects of having had two years of very warm water and very little ice in a row are, are necessarily gone. Um, I, I highlight this because the Bering Sea is the one place that we're most closely watching Pacific halibut distribution. As I mentioned earlier, we have seen some indication of uh, fish movement toward the north. And it's, it's something that we certainly recognize if, if we have a, a prolonged period uh, of warm conditions up there. We need to be aware of the potential for that. And again, that's why we've recommended um, additional fish sampling in the Bering Sea in, in the upcoming years. The second point I'd like to make is with regard to the Gulf of Alaska. And that is that um, we had, starting in 2014, we had three years of very warm water. It was called the, the warm blob in the North Pacific. Uh, that water started out on the surface and then moved progressively into deeper depths over 2015 and 2016. Uh, we didn't have quite the same conditions in 2020, but we did have intermittent what we would call heat wave conditions, where the temperature was in the upper percentiles of what we would consider normal um, for multiple days in a row. Now, we don't know exactly how this translates into effects on the Pacific halibut stock. For Pacific cod, it's been linked to increased need for uh, food 
and um, increased mortality because of less food availability. So these heat wave conditions have been definitely bad for Pacific cod. On the flip side, they seem to have correlated with relatively high recruitment success for sablefish. Uh, and so we are really um, interested to see how this plays out for Pacific halibut, noting that we are just starting to see um, the recruits that were born during this time period in our data. If you were to look back at the earlier slide of the age compositions, the 2014 year class is still a very small circle in our, in our set line survey graph, uh, really not large enough yet to, to determine whether it's a strong or a weak year class. Uh, but we certainly had some anomalous conditions that could be important moving forward. And that, that actually rounds out the um, data section. I uh, provide just three highlights. Uh, the first, just to remind you that these 2011 and 12 year classes are now apparently present basically throughout the stock, both in the survey and the fishery. So this is good. I, I, from two, two years ago, we had considerable discussion about whether these year classes were going to materialize or not, and now they, they are clearly there in the stock. And although our estimates of their magnitude are still uncertain, um, they're, they're definitely present in the stock dynamics. The trends that we've seen are consistent with these year classes moving in. So we have these year classes coming in, but we're not seeing a big response in the indices. We're not seeing a big jump in weight per unit effort or uh, numbers per unit effort. And that's because uh, we have weak recruitments around these year classes. And then finally, as, as I pointed out, size at age, it does appear that there might be some signs of improvement. And uh, I think that might be a, a logical break point and we could take up modeling uh, after lunch at the discretion of the chair. Yeah, thanks very much, Dr. Stewart. I think this would be a good place to take a break. Um, I see you're bang on one o'clock almost there too. Um, I'm gonna suggest uh, that we take a break for, uh, for lunch for 45 minutes and come back at quarter to two. Um, if there's any opposition from commissioners, please let me know. Okay, I'm not seeing any. So we will break now and uh, take up with Dr. Stewart at quarter to two.